known as the Paid Time Off legislation. I would like to acknowledge and welcome my colleagues that have joined me, Councilmember Adrian Adams, and of course, the public advocate, Jamani Williams. As I just mentioned, today we'll be hearing an important piece of legislation proposed introduction 800A, sponsored by a former mem uh, member of the City Council and now public advocate, Jamani Williams. This bu bill would ex expand the Earn Sit and Sit Time Act by requiring private employees in New York City to provide paid personal time to employees. In addition to the current requirement of paid sick and safe time, to be clear, this is not a new issue. Then Council Member Jamani Williams introduced this bill in 2014, and the public advocate continues to be a leader on this matter. The mayor has recently embraced and championed the paid time off, on his, and his efforts have helped to bring us in this matter to the level of discourse we are seeing today. I want to take a moment to express appreciation to the public advocate and the mayor for their continued advocacy for the support for working people. There are n no federal standards in the United States that set minimums for paid personal time and paid holidays. This is left up to negotiation between employees and employer. In many instances over the past decade, labor unions through collective bargaining have won benefits for working people in an environment largely created by business. Though these efforts have created a framework for both workers and enterprise has been created. Key to this effort has been an understanding that allows business to thrive while providing employees with compensation and safety standards along with benefits such as health coverage, retirement, and paid time off. Specific to the last time, according to the last time that According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics 2018, 76% of private sector employees receive paid vacation days. On average, one year of employment, the, after one year of employment, these employees are granted 10 paid vacation days. The number grows as the years of tenure with the employee increases. In 2017, the average worker with five years of experience at a company was given 15 days of paid vacation. The average employee with a 20-year tenure received 20 vacation days. As usual, this committee will be leading the way in labor law. No other state or in, in the country requires paid time off for workers. While paid family leave laws, when it comes to paid personal time, there is no mandate anywhere. Today, our committee will discuss the impacts of this proposal and what it looks to change. We look forward to hearing from the administration, as well as the business leaders, small business owners, and workers about our concerns and endorsements alike. If, if, if you cannot testify and are watching remotely, you can please reach out to us through the committee directly um, by Twitter and through the council, and you can always uh, give your concerns to the community in, in the very near future. I think we're gonna close this out by the week's end. So we are already here, we have already heard from many small businesses uh, and others within that community that the requirement of, of, of five employees is too onerous on small businesses. We are here to discuss the workplace mandates that employers face in the city of New York. We look forward to hearing from all those who are, will be testifying today. Vital to this process will be the testimony that is received from the Department of Consumer Affairs and Protections the agency that will be tasked with the outreach and enforcement of expansion of paid sick and safe laws. I hope to hear about any outreach with the small business community that the department has engaged in prior to the hearing uh, to address the legitimate concerns of small business owners, particularly those with extreme end of this, the pay scale of, of only five uh, employees. 
Before I turn it over to the public advocate for his opening remarks, I, I'd like to thank my staff, uh, Legislative Director Brandon Clark, Senior Advisor Joe Goldblum, and my Chief of Staff, Mr. Ali Vasunajad. I'd um, like to thank uh, Committee Council, uh, Malcolm, Kevin, Charles, Ishmael, Kendall, and Elizabeth. There you go. And uh, now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, public advocate, Jamani Williams, for his opening statements. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you for holding this hearing today and the entire Civil Service and Labor Committee staff for their work in holding this hearing. Uh, to all my colleagues in attendance, uh, to the mayor, and to representatives from all sides of this issue for your testimony today. The United States is the only vast e economy in the world that doesn't guarantee some level of paid leave. That's inexcusable, and it's time to change. Uh, I was thinking that when I introduced this in 2014. I'm now happy that the climate has changed and we've come this far. There are those who try to paint this policy as too far left, too ambitious, too progressive, but so was the eight-hour day once. We call ourselves an advanced economy, but we're the only ones that does not mandate some level of paid personal leave. Our country is far behind, our people are overworked and undervalued, and it's time for New York City to make up for lost time. Time off is not a luxury, uh, it's a necessity, one many don't have. Uh, as I mentioned at the press conference, I myself just fresh off a seven day vacation. Uh, I don't remember the last time I've taken a week off, uh, not because I don't have it, but because culturally we have been trained to believe that taking time off makes something wrong with you, uh, that you are lazy, that you are not working hard enough. This law is not only to change things statutorily, but to change the culture of what time off means. Uh, why this is, uh, it, as I mentioned, it's a necessity one many don't have. Why this is can often be explained because of the love of money and because of people who believe that's more important than their workers. To be clear, it's unfair to presume that is the only reason. Small businesses face new and escalating market pressures day by day, and it's all too easy for someone to take the leap of being their own, own employer and fall short. I'm speaking from experience. My own small business uh, didn't work out, but it gave me a, and I'm now attuned very often to the issues of small business. We can look out for worker protections and small business owners alike. If we can manage to find billions in economic benefits for Amazon and the wealthiest man in the world, we can certainly find the same benefits to help mom and pop shops. I'm looking forward to hear uh, the issues of uh, small business. Uh, I'm hoping we can change uh, from a chorus of not right now, not now to how best we can best effectively and efficiently put this through protecting workers while making sure that our small businesses have the ability to grow and thrive. I approach this hearing mindful that in a city as complex as ours, bright lines are hard to come by. I look forward to taking in feedback and suggestions from all stakeholders in this issue and working to craft the best bill possible. As uh, we continue to remember, this is not about an issue of luxury. This is not an ask for something people first just want. It is something that human beings need and have to have to live a productive life, to help ease the mind, the stresses of work, that can also manifest itself physically. So I hope we move forward with all that in mind. Again, uh, thank you to the chair, and I look forward to the hearing. Thank you, Mr. Public Advocate. Uh, we've been joined by Council Member Maisel, the Great Borough of Brooklyn. Um, with that, we're going to swear in our first panel. We've been joined by Commissioner Salas, Sam Krinsky, Jill Maxwell and Casey Adams. If you could just raise your right hand. Yes. Do you swear to tell the truth before this committee and answer council member questions truthfully? I do. Please go ahead. Good morning, Chairman Miller and members of the committee. I am really honored to be here today to be discussing this proposal. My name is Lorelei Salas and I am the commissioner for the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs, recently renamed the New York City Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today about Intro 800, a bill that would, for the first time, require employers to provide paid personal time to New York City workers. In January, Mayor de Blasio announced that New York City would become one of the first jurisdictions in the nation to require employers to provide two weeks of paid personal time. The bill before you today 
which has been informed by discussions with workers, employers, and other stakeholders, public advocate Jamani Williams and the council will make that commitment a reality. This proposal is another important piece of Mayor de Blasio's commitment to making New York the fairest big city in the nation by advancing worker rights and protections. New Yorkers work hard. We may be called the city that never sleeps, but that does not mean that hardworking New Yorkers should be forced to miss important family and life events like parent-teacher conferences, weddings, funerals, or anniversaries, because they cannot get time off work or afford to go without a paycheck. Workers in the greatest city on earth should not be made to choose between keeping a job that supports their families and having enough time to rest, recharge, or handle family matters. Unfortunately, that is the reality for the up to one million New Yorkers who do not currently have any paid personal time. The lack of paid personal time affects workers in all industries and walks of life, but it is especially glaring among those workers who have the most precarious schedules and are paid the lowest wages. Part-time workers are significantly more likely to lack access to paid personal time than full-time workers. In addition, low- and middle-income workers are less likely to receive paid personal time than higher-income peers. Time to rest and recharge should not be a privilege, enjoyed mainly by the most stable and well-paid workers in our city. All New Yorkers, no matter what type of work they do or how much money they make, deserve a day off. The benefits of paid personal time for workers, businesses, and the economy as a whole are clear. Vacation and time off from work are associated with improved health, lower stress, lower likelihood of depression, and more happiness at home and at work. Paid time off is associated with higher employee morale and retention, less burnout, and higher worker productivity. Experts like former Secretary of Labor Robert Reich agree that paid personal time is good for workers, good for employers, and good for the economy. Countries across the globe have recognized the importance of paid personal time by, by enshrining the right to time off in national and regional laws. According to a 2012 report by the International Labor Organization, an overwhelming majority of countries have established the right to a minimum period of annual leave by law. A majority of countries in every region across the globe, from Asia to Africa, the Middle East, Europe, and Latin America, guarantee a minimum amount of paid personal time for workers. Germany, one of the strongest and most productive economies in Europe, currently mandates a minimum of four weeks paid vacation per year. Unlike these countries, the United States does not currently mandate paid personal time at the federal level, nor does any state or city in the country. Today, we have the opportunity to change that and to send a message that workers deserve better. As Mayor de Blasio put it, we as a nation need to get there, and New York City will lead the way. I will now discuss the specifics of the proposal before you. Intro 800 builds on the framework established by New York City's landmark paid safe and sick leave law. The bill requires employers with at least five employees or one domestic worker to provide at least up to 80 hours of paid personal time per year to their workers. The amount of time is a minimum labor standard. Employers may and are encouraged to provide their workers with more generous paid personal time if they so choose. The universe of employees covered by this bill would be the same as those covered by, by the paid safe and sick leave law easing the implementation burden on employers. Like the paid safe and sick leave law, this bill applies to both full and part-time workers. Paid personal time would accrue on an earned basis at the same rate as paid safe and sick leave, one hour of leave earned for every 30 hours worked. Employees would be entitled to use personal time for any reason. Today, we expect to hear from workers, businesses, and advocates, and we welcome their input on the proposed bill. The administration conducted extensive outreach to affected communities to hear questions and concerns and inform the development of this proposal. Over the course of several roundtable events, 
we received helpful feedback from large employers, small businesses, unions, community-based organizations, and policy groups, and of course, workers themselves. You may hear today that New York City employers simply cannot afford to give workers a break, or that the law will be too difficult for businesses to implement. Many of these same objections were raised when New York City became the largest jurisdiction in the country to provide workers with paid safe and sick leave. Time and experience have shown that an overwhelming majority of businesses were able to implement the law's requirement with city outreach and support and without a measurable loss in profits or productivity. A 2016 report co-authored by the Center for Economic and Policy Research and the Murphy Institute entitled No Big Deal, the Impact of New York City's Paid Sick Days Law on Employers found that nearly 85% of employers report that no changes in costs due to the paid safe and sick leave law. In fact, since paid safe and sick leave went into effect, New York City's economy has boomed and our city now has more private sector jobs than ever before in history. In addition, DCWP's experience helping businesses implement and comply with paid safe and sick leave will inform our approach to this process. DCWP will provide businesses with helpful aids like leave trackers, request forms, and notices of employee rights, just as we do now for paid safe and sick leave. This experience also includes our extensive engagement with industry stakeholders and worker communities. Since 2014, we have conducted almost 1,600 outreach events, distributing more than 2 million pieces of literature to promote worker awareness and business education. We believe New York's, New York's businesses are the most dynamic and innovative in the country, and they will be able to implement a law that helps increase productivity and ensure that workers have time to not just survive, but to live fulfilled lives with their families and loved ones. I am honored to be here today to urge the passage of this legislation. I would like to thank public advocate Jamani Williams, Speaker Corey Johnson, Chairperson Miller, members of this committee, and the employer and worker stakeholders who have been generous with their time in offering feedback. Today, New York City has the opportunity to send a message, workers deserve better. Working in our city should mean more than just making ends meet. It should mean time and peace of mind to be present for the moments that shape our lives and the lives of those we love, the marriage of a brother or sister or parents' anniversary, the funeral of an aunt or uncle or close friend, time to visit family abroad, learn a new skill or prepare for an exam, or just enjoy time off to rest and recharge with friends and family. For some New Yorkers, paid personal time will mean the opportunity to keep an immigrant family together across borders or bring family and friends together to celebrate a religious holiday that they would not otherwise get off. This bill will give workers the time they deserve, whatever that means for their lives. I hope you hear from workers today who don't have this benefit or who were promised this benefit but still didn't get it after they earned it. I thank you for the opportunity to testify today and I am happy now to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, so I'm gonna begin our questioning with, could you speak to in respect to paid safe and sick leave, uh, the departments which the department has been tracking uh, over the past few years, uh, any um, negative and unintended consequences such as a reduction of workforce or re workforce uh, reduction of hours um, that you have seen uh, over the past few years? Yes, I'd love to tell you a little bit about the law. We've been enforcing the paid safe and sick leave law since 2014. I can tell you that to date, in the almost five years, we have processed almost 1,800 complaints. We closed over 1,600 cases, and we have awarded workers close to $10 million, mostly in restitution, uh, maybe a couple of million dollars of that in penalties. Um, but the law has been successful. We have uh, the results of a survey uh, that was conducted into 2016, uh, a study that showed that 85% of employers report that no increase in costs for them. 
We also know that uh, there was a report of very um, close to 90% of employers reported no decrease in productivity by their workers. So we think the net effect has been positive for New York City's economy, workers, and businesses. How, how, how many employees does the administra administration estimate to have uh, not have paid time off policy at their workplace? We are estimating close to a million workers in New York City across all industries who do not currently have any paid personal time off. And, and how did the admin uh, derive at this number? I'll defer to my uh, research director, Sam Krinsky. Um, the primary data set we used to estimate the number of workers who lacked coverage is the Community Service Society's Unheard Third Survey. Uh, the 2018 results included um, estimates of vacation access at various employer sizes. So we combined that data with information from the Census Bureau and the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, that give us employment totals for the city uh, at different sizes of employment. Uh, and then combining those two and summing up the total, we got to a, a million workers lacked access. And what are the demographics of these employees? Uh, uh, we did not perform a demographic analysis for this population specifically, uh, but it is representative of the low wage workforce uh, of the city. Okay, that's a different, that's, that, that's taken us in a different direction, but we did want to just, um, is there a specific target audience or are we looking to address that entire one million population that lack um, Yes, we are, leave? we're definitely looking to address the entire one million workers who currently do not have paid personal time. I don't know how we differentiate between one worker and the next. Workers across all industries deserve this time. So whatever you know, employment you have in New York City and wh whatever you come from, whatever language you speak, you deserve the day, the time off. So have, ha have you experienced one industry um, over another that failed to provide paid leave? Yes, with respect to uh, paid, safe, and sick leave law enforcement, I can say that um, uh, some of the industries where we've seen a lack of a compliance with the law have been industries that generally employ um, workers who are who may be immigrant, who, whose first language may not be English. Uh, one industry that we that really rose to the top in terms of our concerns for compliance was the home care industry in New York City. It, as you probably know, uh, it's an industry that's primarily comprised of uh, immigrant women of color. And so that is definitely uh, domestic workers are also, it's another industry in which we are concerned with enforcement. And, and, and in, in that industry, did you notice a difference between those that were represented um, by organized labor and those that were not? and being afforded this benefit? Uh, our initiative to uh, proactively investigate 40 um, uh, home care agencies did not include any uh, agency that had um, a contract with a labor union, a collective bargaining agreement, so I, I cannot say that I would be able to speak about the differences between those two. But, um, you know, this law really is meant to cover all workers who do not fall under collective bargaining agreement where they may have negotiated these kinds of benefits already, right? So we're speaking for those workers who don't have any time off. I also want to say that f there are a number of workers I've spoken to personally who were promised paid personal time at the beginning of employment, who worked really hard to earn that leave, who uh, thought that followed all the steps they needed to follow in order to qualify for the leave, asked with enough notice of their employers, and then took the time off with assurances from their supervisors that, that it was fine. They came back to find no work, no job, right? Because there's no guarantee in the law right now that they can go to and say, this is what I earned. It's really up to the whim of some of the employers. So this law will benefit not just the one million workers who don't have the leave, but those who are promised the leave, but whose employers are not willing to fulfill that promise. So that, that allows us to segue kind of into enforcement. I know I've had the opportunity in the past to tour 
uh, in my district and throughout the city with you um, in terms of enforcement around uh, paid, safe, and sick. And um, as you indicated, had been pretty successful in doing so. But uh, what would the outreach look like? Would it be similar? Um, what, what, what would you, or would there be something that would be done differently? Um, because this is uh, certainly, while it is consistent with paid sick, it is it's actually a different benefit. And, and, and do you see any nuances that have to be done different? Do you see that you, your agency and your workforce has the capacity to address these uh, one million potential new clients? As drafted right now, the legislation builds on the framework of the pay safe and sick leave law. And so uh, it captures the same universe of employers that are already covered by the safe, safe and sick leave law. Um, and as you just rightly pointed out, we have been come out to your district to do business education days. We do that regularly. In fact, by law, we're required to conduct 10 business education days a year with different communities. We do more than that because we believe in outreach and education. We think that that's the right in investment to do for our businesses. In addition to that, we are committed to continuing to hold small business roundtables. We also held one with you in your district where I personally come to hear from small businesses and understand what are the challenges they're facing with our enforcement and to make sure that they know that they, there are no barriers in accessing us uh, personally and me personally. So we are committed to that. We, uh, I think that as an administration, we've done uh, a lot to really help relieve the burden on small businesses. Uh, but as an agency, we've created programs like the Visiting Inspector Program. That is not something that was required of us, but it's something that we believe is due to small businesses. We should like make sure that one day there's a new legislation that they, they, they have the information they need in order to succeed. So I, I would anticipate that we would do the same a type of outreach that we did with paid safe and sick leave law, but it would be an ongoing process. It's not something that we would do once. We will do that um, continuously. We'll work with elected officials to make sure that we're getting to those neighborhoods where like, there's more information and outreach needed. And we will also come up with tools that will help small businesses with implementation. We have done that. We do that across all of the laws that we enforce. We put together posters, FAQs. We translate those materials so it's not a cost to the employer. Uh, and we're here to, um, today to hear from small businesses as to what else we can do to help them um, implement this law when it becomes law. So I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that you will continue your extensive outreach. And certainly also glad to hear that, that um, the city will be providing technical and other assistances to small businesses as they attempt to uh, comply uh, with any um, changes in legislation that, that come to be. Um, so in, in, in your outreach um, and your e economic analysis, what would be the impact of requiring all employees of five or more employees, uh, in, including the one for domestic uh, workers, uh, to provide paid personal time? And um, has there been analysis on, on a number, another number, uh, be it seven or ten, some of the numbers that we've heard? Um, yes, so to um, answer your question, um, we think that starting at business sizes of five employees or more is the right way to, to do this work. We think that we've already taken into account by making sure that uh, employers that are smaller than that with four or less employees do not have to pay for their time off. Um, this law is consistent, this proposal is consistent with what we have in the books for paid safe and sick leave law, and as I said earlier, uh, a few years after the law became implemented, we saw that employers reported, uh, I think about 85% of employers reported no increase in their costs. So there will be some pressure for employers, that is true, but we think that the right, it's not the right way to, to alleviate the cost by uh, saying that we're going to limit basic minimum protections for workers. This is an important piece of legislation. Let me just say that, I have, before having this position with the city, I worked for close to 10 years with the New York State Department of Labor and the Attorney General's Office supervising uh, compliance with minimum wage and overtime payments. A lot of my investigations 
uh, covert cases where workers were employed up to 72 hours a week. That is a lot of hours in one week. So workers deserve this time off, and I think that we can make this happen. Again, the city is committed to working with small businesses and making sure that we hear from them about their concerns with, um, and challenges with implementing this law. But you know, 94% of countries already have it, right? In, in Europe, you have countries in Central and South America. I was born in Peru. Peru already requires one month paid vacation on top of paid holidays, right? It's not a new concept, as you said earlier, and it's something that has been proven we have strong economies, countries with strong economies and strong worker protections, and we can make this happen. We've been joined by council members King and, and Joe and I. And um, before I, I go any further, I'm gonna pass it over to the public advocate for his question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, commissioners, for, for the testimony. Um, I have a few questions. I did wanna go back to one that the chair asked about um, negative consequences so far. I think you said 80% of businesses had no negative impact on paid safe and sick law, is that correct? Close to 85%. 85%. What about the 50% who did? Um, how many employees does that cover and what kind of negative impact did they have? So um, we, we would be happy to um, submit a copy of the report for your review. But like I said, 85% reported no increase in costs. Um, and I believe that there was some increase in cost, not more than 3% for um, the remaining percentage of that. But we'll be happy to provide you with copies of that study. So, uh, so right, right now you don't have the information on what the negative impact was for the other 15%? It's um, the same report uh, our side, I cited tells us that, where is that? No, I'm sorry, I don't have that information right now. Okay, I think it's critically important. I don't want to dismiss it. I'm glad there was only 85%, but 15% uh, can be a, a significant subset, and I, I would like to understand what the negative impact was as we move forward. Um, when I first introduced the bill in 2014, this was, a, it, it was a, to apply to employers of 10 people or more. Since then, paid sick leave passed, applying to employees of more than five employers. Uh, I know the administration really wants to do uh, five plus for personal pay time, and that's what we're hearing. But as you know, uh, myself and, and I believe the chair uh, are not quite there yet. And so can you explain why you believe so much that it should be uh, five plus like paid sick leave? Yes, I would urge it to to co consider that if you um, raise the threshold from a business size of five employees or more to about 10, you lose close to 115,000 workers who probably most need this time off. We, we have uh, quite a good number of workers that are both in the retail industry and also in the hospitality industry. These are workers who are often working part-time, workers who live off tips. Uh, and the people who are more likely to be subject to income instability. And so I do think that it's important that we continue to think about how to make this law happen for workers that are employed at businesses of uh, five employees or more, uh, because we don't want to start leaving workers behind. I think they, I don't know, if the, hopefully the partnership will testify. I think they have different numbers that say it's much lower than 115,000 workers. But I just want to be clear, is that, is that the only reason the, just the amount of workers that you believe that we should keep it consistent with uh, paid sick leave? I mean, there's definitely a, a strong argument for consistency, right? Uh, right now, uh, employers and workers know that their obligations kick in and the rights kick in at five employees or more. It will be more complicated when we have to have two different messages for two different thresholds and uh, for implementation. So that is definitely a strong argument, but I think the strongest argument is that we want to treat every worker uh, with dignity and respect, and that they all deserve uh, paid personal time off. Well, the consistency, uh, do you mean consistency of enforcement or consistency for the employer? It's um, consistency of enforcement, consistency of education for employers, for employers to know that this is simple and this is the way that it is, and there's no, you don't have to be thinking about different laws for different 
um, cutouts of thresholds of workers, but also for workers themselves, right? It's a, it's a simpler message for them to understand that if I work for an employer that has five employees or more, I have access to both the paid uh, safe and sick leave and the paid personal time. Um, so on the consistency peripherally, and I hope we'll hear from some more of the work um, employers today, they, they seem to not think it would be better for them to have it consistent in the way you're talking, that they would be able to administer both laws, even if they had different uh, thresholds of, em of employees. So hopefully we'll hear from them, and, and, they'll, and hopefully someone will stick around so you can hear what they're saying on that issue. Um, and of course, I am fully, uh, fully on board making sure we cover uh, as many works as possible. But we are making a decision, and we could do from zero up, but we're saying five and up. And so there are gonna be some workers, even in your bill, that your, the, the bill that's presented now, five up, there are still gonna be workers who won't include it. And the question is trying to find a balance uh, with all the things that we're asking employees to do to make sure we are not overburdening them, uh, particularly we're not providing or even offering the same support that we offer to Amazon to the small businesses. And so I'm always wary and, and cautious of that, and I want us to be cautious of that as well. Um, and I'm not sure that um, as the businesses come and testify, they will say 100% that they agree with this. And so um, and even doing this, and uh, but I do believe we should be still hearing what they're saying in terms of how we apply this, because I do want to get from not now to how best. And so. Um, I haven't been persuaded yet, and I'm hoping you have some other answers of why we should keep it to five plus. And so hopefully, just wanted to give you another opportunity if there's something else um, that says it should be at, f at five plus besides what you said already. I think I'm not doing the, I'm not doing it justice. I think that I'd love for you to hear directly from the workers who are impacted by this issue, right? That they don't have access to that. I sit here with the privilege of enjoying paid personal time. We all do here, right? We take it for granted that there are plenty of people out there who can't take two hours paid personal time a day to handle an emergency. I want you to hear from the workers because frankly, I could not look them in the eye and say, you do, you do not deserve this, uh, this time off. And I think that, again, when I mentioned that um, workers, uh, 115,000 workers that you lose by lowering the threshold, uh, I'm sorry, by raising the threshold, you end up with, uh, again, the majority of those workers are employed in industries such as retail and uh, hospitality. And I do think that it's important that we don't let, leave them behind. I, I agree, except even with the bill as worded, we will be leaving workers behind. So uh, you will be saying to some workers that they're not covered. My question is, why the five point? Because I, I appreciate the motion that you the emotion you present and making sure that we, we hear the workers, because that's the only reason I put this forward. And we heard some uh, passionate um, discussion already downstairs. But exactly what you just said, we are going to be saying to employers who have zero to five. Am I correct? So you will be saying exactly that to them, that they are not covered. That is true. Uh, okay. For employers that are smaller than five uh, employees, right, four or less, they do not have to pay for the leave, they have to still provide unpaid leave, but they, they do not have to compensate the workers yeah. for that leave. I'm just saying that because you, I don't want to make it seem as if we both don't agree that all workers should be covered, but even in what you're presenting now, some workers won't be, this, be, be covered, even in what the administration wants. So I don't want to make it seem like we're trying to do something that the administration isn't already doing. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, and we're definitely here today to hear from uh, small businesses and other industry um, um, players today, we want to hear what the challenges would be with keeping this threshold at five employees or more. Thank you. Um, according to data provided by uh, the administration, 6% of New York City's total workforce is employed by six businesses with five to nine employees, and of that percentage, half of them already have paid personal time from their employers. What are the circumstances of the other half? Why don't they have personal time off? Do you have any insight into that? As to why some, why about half of the workers do not have paid, yeah. paid personal time? I mean, really, there is, again, there's nothing in the law in this country that uh, requires any employers to provide any kind of benefit, right? I think I am concerned that even with those workers that were offered, that are part of the 50%, the half of New Yorkers who actually are supposed to be getting this leave, I'm concerned that workers are not receiving it, right? Because there is nothing, again, nothing, no guarantee in the law that they have a recourse to anyone if they don't get the paid time that they earned. So um, I don't know the reasons why. I mean, I think we're well behind. I mean, we spoke about all the countries that already have this. Um, 
I think that we need to start like sooner than later to make sure that this is the law, that there's a floor. Again, some businesses out there are already providing this benefit and some businesses are providing more than that. And for the half of the businesses in New York City that provide the benefit, we are just raising the standards so that they're not competing at, at a disadvantage when we have all businesses um, held to the same standard. Are there, are, they, are there any other agencies you do or would partner with in enforcing the act? Um, in terms of the enforcement, the enforcement will be squarely within my agency. In terms of doing outreach and education, we will be working closely with small business services. We always do. Every time we do outreach uh, or business education days, small business roundtables, we're always in communications with them to make sure that we have a coordinated approach to our work. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm looking forward, uh, Commissioner, to working with you and the administration uh, with the small businesses uh, to make sure we go from not now to how best and um, impassionately protecting the workers who we're going to hear from uh, just in a few moments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Public Advocate. Uh, before I go to Council Member Adams, Mazel, and King, I, I just want to follow up on uh, public advocates line of questioning uh, about um, small businesses. And so with the legislation which represents, this legislation which represents another mandate on employers, and we've seen a, a bevy of those over the past few years in, in this administration and our tenure in, in the council, and uh, while those uh, mandates have certainly improve the quality of life for workers such as paid sick um, and, and, and safe uh, $15 minimum wage and other anti-discrimination uh, training mandates. Uh, certainly it, it has had an, an impact uh, on small business. Has the department considered how it will support um, small businesses as they adapt the, to this new operational environment? And if so, what does that look like differently from paid safe sick? So I would just say that the commitment from this administration to working with small businesses and helping them to thrive in the city is clear, right? We have implemented as a city uh, through the Department of Small Business Services, 30 commitments to reduce the re regulatory burden on small businesses. The commitments are projected to save businesses own, business owners $50 million and reduce the time it takes to complete business transactions with the city by 30%. Um, we have reduced fines for small businesses by almost 50% since Mayor de Blasio came into office. Uh, and we continue to think about uh, legislation like the cure laws that the council work on to make sure Excuse that. Excuse me. To continue, please. We will continue to work with small businesses to make sure that we continue to address um, how to make enforcement um, part of what um, helps them run their business as well. Um, one thing that I would say is that, um, again, as part of our outreach and education, every anytime we implement a new law, we have um, the interests of businesses very clearly in our minds, especially because in this city we have so many small uh, business immigrant owners, right, who speak different languages, who come from different countries, who oftentimes are importing the business practices from their countries. And it's not that they are trying to break the law, it's just that they're not aware of what the legislation is, what the rules are. So we invest a lot on um, education and going door to door, really door to door talking to businesses and spending as much time as we can to understand, to make sure that they get what it is that they need to do to avoid fines from the city um, and to bring to them tools that they, they can use to make implementation easier. So we will do the same that we do with every other law that we have uh, in the books. And we have learned along the way um, when we know that um, there are certain um, industries or sectors of businesses that need more, more um, more of our resources, we accommodate that. So we're committed to making this work for the business community. And, 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 and as I said, um, I've had the pleasure of, of touring with you and, and, and as uh, a matter of outreach and reaching out to the various businesses and not just in my district, but throughout the city and, and they're greatly appreciated. But I think that this new policy 
is going to, along with the other, uh, in addition to the other policies that have been, been implemented, are going to bring about new challenges. New challenges such as if you look at paid safe and sick and, and now uh, paid leave, we're talking about uh, 15 days per employee, average of five. So a small business potentially has to deal with 75 days of, of uh, time and attendance that they now have to learn to manage. Do they have the skills or uh, small business services or any other agency going to provide the technical assistance and resources that allow them to manage a workforce minus 75 days and outside of uh, what's different from collective bargaining, most collective bargaining agreements where there are certain uh, um, um, mandates around usage of time and attendance, I, I don't see that in the legislation and potentially you have one or two people out on vacation, somebody calling mm -hmm. out sick. Um, yeah. ha have we, sure. you know, uh, kind of, yeah try to look at some of those collective bargaining agreements or some other policy that is out there that would not further burden um, small businesses and, and, and so that we can provide that type of technical assistance as well as what was already done because certainly these are, are, are new challenges. Yes, certainly. Uh, and, and today is obviously an opportunity, another opportunity to hear from small businesses on what they want us to consider as we continue to develop this legislation. But I would say that in the law, there's room for rulemaking from our agency so that we can provide clear guidance on what kinds of policies, legitimate policies employers can set in order to manage staffing needs, right? We all have to, those of us who have staff have to to do that all the time, right? We know that you can't have everyone out on vacation at the same time. We understand that, and we're willing to work with employers to make sure that they come up with policies that are uh, that are in compliance with the law, but that are, that are also not used in a discriminatory manner, right? That they provide enough notice to workers, and uh, they're clear, and people cannot argue that some people were treated differently and others than, than others. So uh, that is certainly something I would look forward to, to working with the admin on. I know that uh, FMLA, um, it gives a lot of latitude towards the employer to administer those benefits, but it happens not also, always in, in, in the best way. And, and I think that it's something that we can all work in collectively, make sure that it, it, it certainly benefits um, the, the, the workers, that they have access to this benefit, but that is not an overburden on on businesses. With that I'm going to pass it over to Councilmember Adams for a question and followed by Councilmember. Good Jonah. morning, Commissioner. Good morning. King. Thank you, Mr. Jonah. Chair. And I certainly thank uh, the public advocate for his legislation, very important and impacting legislation. Uh, thank you for uh, touring my district with me. I remember that day very well and I think that it's very profound what you said. What I find in District 28 in Queens, that because of the um, immig immigrant population, there is a disconnect. And we found that day that it just is simply education that is needed, very, very desperately, um, to our small businesses. So to that very, very simple question, I'd just like to know what the feedback um, what is the feedback that you have received from small businesses because of the policy? And what is the feedback that you have received from the workers since this policy? Mm -hmm. um, yes, so um, I would say just a couple of things about feedback from small businesses. And I'm sure today we'll hear plenty of feedback. Um, but one thing I would say is that Initially, most employers do want to be able to provide for the, the workers and appreciate the work that's being put into their businesses, and they are more conflicted about how to just make it happen, right? And so um, I think that one thing that will concern small businesses is the kind of notice that they can ask employers to provide, right, before they actually take the time off. Um, so that, because that will help them in managing their staffing needs. So that's certainly something that we want to hear from small businesses on. We have also heard from small businesses about, you know, what happens when you already offer certain 
um, time off because you maybe you close the business for a certain period of time, you know, what happens then? So we're hoping to hear today the feedback from small businesses on what they think would be the right policy, but we also want to hear from workers, right? Because the reality is that, again, like I said, it, it's really easy to forget when you uh, already um, are able to take the time off what it feels like for workers who don't have any access to that. Um, and who cannot afford to take the time off, even if the employer wants to give them the time, if they don't get paid, there's just like one or two weeks that they're missing wages, wages that they need to make ends meet at the end of the month. I heard from one airport worker who came to my office and said, you know, I haven't been back to my country in like 12 years because it's too expensive to go. And I had a recent death in my family and I had to make the very difficult choice that I just couldn't make it. I could not go back because even if I had the time for my employer, it wasn't get, getting paid, right? I wasn't getting paid for that time. I'm missing two weeks out of the month of wages. I can't pay my rent if I don't have those wages. And so I think that we need to hear from those voices today um, and also think about what kind of city we want to leave for the next generation of New Yorkers. I have two kids who are graduating college soon. They don't know what it's like out there and like right now it, you either are born into wealth and you don't have to worry about income stability or you are one of the lucky New Yorkers, one of the half of New Yorkers that actually get offered some kind of paid uh, personal time. It should not be up to, it should not be a matter of luck, right? And so I, I think that, you know, this is a city that can continue to thrive, continue to have a strong economy. We have the most jobs available right now than ever, 4.5 million jobs. We can do that and still bring protections to workers um, because we're not the only ones. This, this is not an experiment. This is something that has been proven around the world. Thank you, I, I agree with you. And hopefully with all of us working together um, to make this a reality, but best for everyone from small businesses to workers alike, that we will come to a happy medium for everybody in, involved because our workers are extremely important as are our small businesses to help keep this city going uh, effectively. So thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member Adams, Council Member Kane. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Public Advocate. More point, thank you, Commissioner, for joining us today. Um, I start with this. Um, I always say people pay attention to people who participate. So I want to thank all of you who came out today to participate in this conversation to make sure that your voices are heard and that we do right by you while maintaining small businesses. I move to the next thing. We always in this world, so we, we use these, these famous nine words, small businesses are the pillar of our communities. So what are we doing today to make sure that that continues to happen? While I'm looking at the legislation, and you can help me answer this question because I understand whether under four, some things don't apply, over five, everything applies. So knowing those rules that are in place from paid sick leave and looking for earn more sick days and all more vacation days, is, has there ever been, as I looked at the documents, based on the financial profits of a business, whether they can sustain themselves with all these rules that have been thrown at them? Because at the end of the day, while we want to make sure people have an opportunity to be with their families and get paid at the same time, we don't want to put businesses out of business as well. So I just want to get an idea, while we use numbers of our participants in a business, are we looking at the final financial impact of the business or the existence of the business and saying, Hey, if a business is worth a million dollars, they can handle all of this. If they're worth fifty thousand dollars, all these rules will really just put them under underground. So I just want to get how did is that factor into these conversations and the legislation? I cannot sit here and give you an, a full analysis of what the impact has been on all of the recent legislation that has been. Uh, put forward by both the council and the administration. I can tell you from our experience enforcing paid safe and sick leave law, when we heard that four years ago, five years ago, that the sky was going to fall, that we were going to lose jobs, that's not the case. We're here with a strong economy, stronger than ever. We have uh, employees who are receiving the benefit, employers who are providing the benefit, and um, this law, this, this proposal now, really builds on the same uh, framework that we have under paid safe and sick leave law. It covers the same universe of employers. Uh, like I said earlier, um, there was a survey that was done that showed that 85% of employers reported that they did not see an increase in costs to their businesses. So I think I am confident 
confident that we, we have a healthy economy and healthy businesses and that we can make this happen. Well, we're trusting this conversation will continue and evolve because we know we're not, as I'm looking at, we're, I know we're not there 100 percent. There's people who are saying, yes, this is a wonderful thing because, yes, it is good for people to be able to take off when they get sick and even get paid at the same time. But we do understand that our small businesses, depending on their bottom line, whether or not this is feasible for all of them to act, whether you got, if you own a pizza shop with four people and if everybody's out at the same time, store doesn't open. So five pizza, even if you have five, you know, if, the, if everybody's out, the pizza shop doesn't open. So I'm just asking us as we continue to figure out what makes sense that we will really continue to be responsible to the home, to, not, to the business owner, as well as to those of who are doing the work so the business can stay in business. So with that all being said, I'm just thank you again for your day testimony and answering our questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember King. We're going to hear from Councilmember Jonai. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you for the great questions uh, from both the Chair and the Public Advocate. Uh, Commissioner, I'm actually concerned from the very beginning that this hearing is being held on Tuesday, the day after Memorial Day. Now, I'm not a conspiracy theory-minded person, but it sounds to me like this was done intentionally so there would be very low participation today. But besides that, you know, you, you're, you're referring to countries that have already adopted these rules. Why aren't we making this push at a state level versus a city level? Sir, uh, thank you for your question. I, I would love to be able to have the state pass this kind of legislation. I would love to have other cities in the country do this. And we are doing what we can as uh, New York City's administration, and I think it's the right, the right way to go. Uh, with respect to the schedule, I mean, I really, this was coordinated with the council, and this is a date that was provided to us for the hearing. So well, I can I assure you these things happen with good reason. They don't happen just by chance. Mm -hmm. uh, so I believe that this was done for that specific reason. Because all week, I've heard back from chambers and bids saying, we're not even aware. Merchant associations saying, had we known, how could they do this on Tuesday, right after Memorial Day? We weren't given notice. So I believe this was done intentionally. But besides that, and the reason why I say the state versus the city, because already there is a difference between a small business in New York City and the rest of the state. We have a minimum wage difference. We're given advantages to small businesses that operate out of New York City and putting a stronger burden on small businesses in New York City. And I want to correct you on the, the SBS program that you were referring to, by the way, is Small Business First, which was initiated four years ago. It's supposed to have gone through the 6,000 rules and regulations in New York City to remove old, uh, outdated regulations. Do you know how many rules they've actually changed in four years? No, sir. 80. And they modified them. They didn't get rid of a single rule or regulation. Modified means they actually made worse. And it only cost $9 million a year. So we spent $27 million in three years of taxpayer dollars to modify 80 rules and regulations. Government needs to stop trying to help because every time we help, we hurt businesses. And I want to make this clear for the audience. I am not choosing a side between employer and employee. I speak to employers all the time. I come out of that world. And they say, we want a happy employee. We want an employee that's going to stay with us and be able to provide for their family. But we can't provide those coverages those salaries, those benefits, while also giving to the worst city in the world for small business. In this budget, do you know what the real estate tax increase is? No, sir, I don't. $1.8 billion. That's over last year's increase. Do you know what that increase was? $1.5 billion. That's all going and trickling down to those very small businesses that are trying to survive. 
And on the way here to City Hall today, do you see the commercial corridors? Do you see the vacancies that are out there? Government does a great job of pegging employee against employer. That is not the issue. The target and the cause is New York City with overtaxation, overregulation, giving unfair competition to anyone that operates out of New York City. Employees are part of a family with that employer when you refer to small businesses. They just can't give to both. Do you know what the unemployment rate is today in New York City? It's about 4.2, I think, something like that. Very close, 4.3. Commissioner, in this type of a climate, you know what the number one complaint is from employers? I need employees. The re turnover rates, the vacancies. I can't find a decent employee that wants to stay with me and grow with me. They're leaving for better opportunities. They're not stuck in those positions. That's what I hear out there in the small business world. Help me get a stable employee, someone that'll stay with me. I want him to stay with me. This is working against them, not for them. See, we have scissors in one hand and a hammer in the other. And we tell our small businesses, which one do you want? So as we pay more in taxes, and we pay more in fees and have more regulations, there's only one place they can take it from, the employees, because the bottom line doesn't sustain it. 50% of small businesses never make it to year five. And if you're a restaurant, 80% of restaurants never make it to year five. You are putting a burden on small business without giving them any help anywhere else. You are destroying small businesses in New York City. You are forcing them to go robotics and automated just so they can compete and keep their doors open. Or you are forcing them to operate in the shadows where they don't comply with New York City rules and regulations because there's no way they can. Look at the people in that audience, and I really do hope you will stay here for the entire hearing yourself to hear the pleas of the small businesses, the few that are here, because of the lack of notice and the day that this hearing was held on. There's going to be major pushback against this administration. Why here, why now, why today? And it's not because he wants to help the employee. It's because our mayor is out there now on a national agenda so you can deliver to the country and this nation and look at the great work I'm doing. I've never met a person that worked so hard for a job that they didn't do from the very beginning. Council member, please uh, ask your questions to the commissioner. I'm sorry, Kim Chair, but this was really a passionate issue that I myself, a small business chair for New York City and the City Council, found out about this last week. If I found out about it, Chair, our small businesses never got received the notice that they should have. And these are life-changing. Those small businesses, Commissioner, that invested everything that they had in those small businesses and they valued their employees, this may be the straw that breaks their back. And when businesses leave New York City to go to Westchester, where they pay, less in minimum wage, have less restrictions, and now less benefits to their employees, we're going to be asking ourselves, how did we let this happen? 
And then I want to see those that are going to say, we should have thought this one out. Thank you. May I respond just briefly um, sure. to a couple of things? One, I would say that we have in the last few weeks, a uh, couple of months, held several small business roundtables, uh, roundtables with all sizes businesses to get input from them. And so I believe that I'm not sure who exactly got notice when, but I know that this is something that was not a surprise to any of them, and we did receive feedback from businesses. I would also argue that exactly what businesses are looking for, a stable workforce, well, these policies like these, like paid personal time, actually contribute contribute to having a productive workforce, a healthier workforce. And I think that it's true that there are pressures on employers, and we're here to Today, hearing from them, we want to understand their concerns and the challenges, but 50% of businesses in New York City already say that they give paid personal time to workers, right? They are making it happen. So I believe that the rest of them can make it happen too. And sir, I would just say that workers in all industries, uh, no matter what they do, are uh, deserving of time off, and uh, no one is more important than anyone else, and it cannot just be that workers at the top of the ladder are receiving these benefits and not our lowest income workers. Workers. Chair, I, I, if it's okay, the commissioner asked a brought up a very important part. I am not saying that our workers don't deserve time off. I am not saying that. I am saying that employee, employers cannot give to employee and New York City government through force mandates. They just can't. The bottom line doesn't sustain it. What was the feedback that you received from our small businesses in reaching out to them? And did you reach out to them yourself, or was it your staff? It was um, a joint um, um, project from both the administration, people at City Hall, and my, my staff, who were at these several roundtables. Um, I, um, and I think, again, I, like I said earlier, businesses, for the most part, express uh, um, really a uh, desire to treat their workers well and to make sure that they were rewarding people for their productivity and the contributions to their businesses. I think some of the concerns were around notice, about staffing needs, and those are the things that we want to hear from them today to make sure that we draft the legislation that, that is workable and that benefits both workers and businesses. How is this going to work at the scheduling requirements where an employer can't ask an employee without giving them adequate notice? Council, we're going to do a second round. Yeah, thank chance, you. Okay. But you, you feel free to answer the question. Like I said, we will definitely be working out those issues uh, with today's feedback and continue ongoing conversations with businesses. Thank you, Commissioner. And and again, for for the record, we have reached out to uh, the chambers chambers uh, and and uh, those representing the business community where um, it is often difficult for small businesses to take off, close their doors and show up, but they are represented by a body and those bodies hopefully are here today and that their voices will be heard and that those voices will be a part of this new policy uh, when it takes effect. We're gonna hear now from Council Member Eric Orange. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Mr. Chair, I appreciate uh, the time, Commissioner, I apologize, I'm running late today, but I did get a chance to review your testimony. Um, let me just uh, preface my question with uh, just a brief remark that I, I was one of the original co-sponsors of paid sick leave. I, I think I was the only uh, Republican on the bill when Gail Brewer introduced it in a previous session. So I, I support the concept of paid sick leave. What, what bothers me about this bill in particular is the enormous burden that it would place on small businesses. This isn't like the mayor and the city wants to go after these corporate multi-billion dollar corporations that are taking advantage of, uh, uh, of workers, people who are just trying to make ends meet. This is going to have a detrimental impact, I believe, on the mom and pop shops, so many of which are in my district, in my community, bakeries, pizzerias, clothing stores, nail salons, people that are struggling. Uh, many of them are immigrant owned businesses. They face so many challenges. Now we're adding on another layer uh, and another unfunded mandate. It bothers me. It really bothers me um, uh, to know that they would be impacted in such a negative way by the bill. Um, I would be more comfortable 
if there was a carve-out or a threshold that addressed the fact that small businesses are already paying their fair share to, to stay in business. If the mayor really wants every worker to have uh, personal time, then let the mayor pay for it. Let the city put the funding in and reimburse the businesses. If that's how, if this is such a moral imperative for the mayor, then the city ought to pay for it. But, but we're asking sm small businesses to absorb those costs, and they're struggling already. So I have a big uh, problem with the, uh, the bill as it's currently uh, written. And I know that you've heard some of these concerns already from some of my colleagues or from some folks in the business community from the Chamber of Commerce, but what steps is the administration taking to address some of those concerns? Because these are real concerns faced by real New Yorkers who are just trying to keep their doors open and pay their employees what, what they're entitled to be paid and compensated. Um, yes, thank you for your question and your concerns. And we are uh, definitely committed to hearing from business owners today. We've been meeting with, uh, with them over the last few weeks. We want to hear what concerns they have in, in having this, law, uh, this bill become law and in the implementation period. Um, like we do with every legislation and every law that comes into, into the books, my agency is committed to investing in outreach and education first to make sure that employers are not um, subject to fines unnecessarily just because they didn't realize there's a new law in the books. So we are very committed to spending time in every community, especially like immigrant uh, small business communities, and we do that all the time. I said earlier, we hold uh, business education days where our inspectors are out there visiting door-to-door -door businesses between 70 to 100 businesses in a day just to provide education, not to penalize anyone, but to make sure that employers and managers know, understand their obligations under the laws. The city uh, has committed to reducing fines for small businesses. I can tell you that since, um, at least since Mayor de Blasio came into place, fines are now down by 50 percent, what they used to be before. Um, and we want to do more. Those, we those want are, to do even more. I, I'm, I don't mean to be rude, but those are health code violations related to small businesses that, that are food establishments are down. Buildings department violations are dramatically up. And me, look at the sign violations in the city that was slapped on small businesses. So that's not to suggest that all violations or all fines are down by that percentage. I, I would beg to differ there. The facts are... Are clear. I'm talking just from our own agency's experience, right? Enforcing uh, the rules and laws that we enforce, uh, there's been a decrease by 50% in fines. Um, so we are committed to our small businesses and to our small business owners that speak other languages. We have all our materials in different languages. I have just last week, I was out in Queens with a couple of outreach staff who speak Urdu and Bengali, and you know, we are bringing our services, education. We want to make sure we can communicate with all business owners regardless of what language they speak but I do think that as a city we do want to make sure that we're treating all workers with respect and dignity as I said earlier I think that um, this is not a new concept it's not an experiment this is being done across the world and we have strong economies and strong worker protections um, and it's those are not concepts that are mutually exclusive I think that domestic workers are entitled to this leave uh, and those are often employees that are it's only just one employee uh, working at a household, but they are no less deserving of having paid time off to spend with their families or just to recharge. Councilmember, if I could add, because this question came up from the public advocate earlier um, about the report that was done on paid safe and sick leave, and we thank you for being a sponsor and a champion for that. Um, of the 15, it's actually 14 percent that reported an increase in costs, the majority of them reported, it's about 4.4 percent, reported an increase of less than 1 percent. And in fact, 1.5% of businesses, which is the difference between the 85 and the 14, um, re actually reported that costs went down rather than going up. So I, 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 don't, I don't doubt those numbers. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I would like to see the, the breakdown happy there, to and, I'm, and I'm sure that it's there, and I'm happy to look at that. But my point is that I'm not against treating workers fairly or paying them a living wage or giving them time off, but who pays for it? That's the question that, that, I'm, that I'm bringing up. What I'm saying is that... Bill de Blasio is running for president, and this is a centerpiece of his campaign. And you're not here in that capacity. You're here as government officials. But when he is touting the fact that he is promoting now personal paid sick leave or per personal time off as, as leave, 
but he is not telling the rest of the country or the businesses throughout the city that they are going to be the ones that are actually going to have to pay for it. I think it's very disingenuous. If he truly believes in this, again, as a, as a moral imperative, then the city ought to pay for it. Let's put it in the budget. We're in budget season. If the mayor wants every business in the city of New York to offer personal time off for employees, then let the mayor and the city of New York pay for it. Let's not pass the buck on to the small businesses that are already struggling. That's my uh, point and my concern. I know the chair wants to get back to the hearing, but I, I say that from a point of sincerity, I and you can look back, I was one of the original co-sponsors of paid sick leave, so I'm not against helping workers. But the bill as it's currently written, I think, is going to have a negative impact on small businesses, and we need to provide a reasonable accommodation at the very least. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Councilmember Orwich. And, and, and um, Commissioner, be, be, before you, we let you go, we, we do want to, um, the question has come up time and time again about what type of support, and, and we're talking about um, education, but support, and uh, Councilmember Orwich just mentioned uh, some of the, the larger corporations that receive subsidies. And I know EDC often is engaging these these uh, larger companies in in large, pretty large subsidies um, that comparable on on, on equitable to what, what we're talking about now to small businesses. Often um, they're receiving long-term subsidies of, of millions of dollars to create very few jobs that aren't may or may not be created, does that opportunity exist to provide such subsidies to small businesses? Have we really drilled down and, 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 and done an analysis on how we can really support uh, small businesses? And while I appreciate the numbers specific to paid safe and sick, um, that does not include the advent of $15 an hour and some of the other things. And, and, and considering um, the difference in those responsibilities and, and course of payroll, um, ha have we addressed that? And, and have we taken into uh, account the other responsibilities of, of small businesses that uh, come with the payroll, the, the fees, the uh, workers' compensation, and other insurances that have uh, um, increased, that increased with the size of the payroll as well. Um, have, have we taken those into consideration? Those are the things I know that I have heard. And if so, I think those are the things that would motivate us further to come up with some type of support for small businesses. And, and that would be a conversation that I think that all the members are, are, are interested in hearing. Because um, I believe, as Dr. King, that all labor that uplifts humanity has dignity and should be undertaken with painstaking excellence. And, and judging by the folks that are in the room here today, that is exactly what happens. And, and we don't want to leave it that it is to be done with painstaking excellence. We want those folks who are delivering those services to be compensated. And, and that's the purpose, right? And that the services um, that make the city great are delivered more efficiently, more effectively. And we do that by making sure that the workforce is properly trained, properly um, compensated, and have the proper time off in order for them to provide that. But in order for that to happen, I think as you mentioned, the folks in this room and beyond are going to have to really get together and come up with something uh, solid in order for us to make that happen. And I think everybody here on this council is absolutely committed to ensuring that that happens. So, but in particular, have we looked beyond to those unintended additional costs based on what we've seen and how can we support small businesses? So I would just say that um, the administration is committed to continuing to look and explore uh, what uh, ideas or strategies we need to put into place to make sure that businesses are able to implement these new policies but also thrive. Um, I cannot 
obviously have no authority to 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 commit the city to providing incentives, right? And um, um, we will take that back to our teams and continue to discuss that. Um, but I think that I, I agree with uh, public advocate Jamani Williams that the question shouldn't be, are we doing this? Are we doing this now? But the question should be, how do we make it happen? And I do think uh, we are in the position today to say that we are not going to leave workers behind because workers are not disposable in New York City. So I urge you to continue to work with us in, in pushing for something that really will have a huge impact in people's lives and will be just really will change people's lives. Mm. Thank you. And Council, oh, Council Member, yep. uh, if, I, if I could add, I think you see in the bill, the, the Commissioner mentioned earlier, s that we are acknowledging um, the unique contribution and circumstances of small businesses in New York City. That's why there's some flexibility built into that bill that allows the agency to rule make around notice that might be appropriate in some industries and inappropriate and other based on others based on those unique circumstances. So I think we absolutely agree with you that there are concerns that we want to both learn more about, but also that we already have built into the bill in terms of giving ourselves flexibility to respond to unique circumstances and needs of certain businesses. So I, 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 I absolutely agree. I have no doubt that, that the commissioner uh, you and your team, that you will do your due diligence and, and work with the council and the small businesses to make sure that we get to a space um, that is equitable, but we have, you know, we, we want to see that the same uh, effort uh, to, small, to support small businesses and support workers um, alike um, that has been made to, that we see in supporting Wall Street. And, and other larger businesses uh, throughout the city of New York. We want to make sure that um, those services, those uh, opportunities, those subsidies are afforded small businesses so that these workers here could have the benefits that they're entitled to. And, and, and we subsidize things like uh, ferry service at $10.25 a trip um, that serves a pretty privileged community. And um, we can do the same thing for small businesses. At least we can begin to think about it. And, and so um, I, I know just based on um, our experience over the past four years that I look forward to working with you and your team and, and, and that we're going to get this done and that work is going to have the dignity and respect and the uh, paid time off that they deserve. So thank you for, for coming out. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. So before we call our next panel, I just want to say that we do have a large number of people who will be testifying, and, and so we will be going on a three-minute clock, and we ask that you not, if, if it's more than three minutes, please do not attempt to read the entire statement in, uh, uh, be, because it will be submitted into the record and we want to make sure that we're hearing as many voices as we can. And we will hear everyone who came to testify today will have their voice heard. So uh, again, uh, we want to thank everyone for coming out. The next panel is Saeed Bukas, Pedro Gambillo, Jordani Buckner, Buckner, Whitney Moore, Joshua Stanton. Okay, we can begin. Please uh, make sure that your mic is on. Push the red button, 
and please state your name for the record before giving your testimony. Good morning. <clears throat> I would like to thank the city council for holding this important hearing. My name is Whitney Moore, and I've been working as a checkpoint agent for Ulan America at JFK in Terminal 8 since October 2018. At the airport, I work in a stressful, highly intense environment. It wears on you. Sometimes you just want a day off. The proposed pay time off will help workers like me a great deal because not only will I be able to get time off when I need without sacrificing my paycheck, I can help my mom, my grandmother out around the house just to spend time with them. I want to be able to take time off without worrying whether my job will be there when I get back. One of my concerns is about our sick days at work, which my employer, Ulan America, calls paid time off. We get a total of five days or 40 hours. There's a New York City paid sick leave law that also grants five days or 40 hours if we were sick or need to care for loved ones. It seems a little different from what my employer provides, which a catch-all where you can take it as a sick leave or vacation once you care enough time. I want to make sure that when the paid time off law passes, that it would be in addition to the city's sick leave law so that employers don't violate either law and shortage us workers with something less than the two laws provide. I appreciate the opportunity to address this hearing because this is very important to my coworkers and I. It will help so many workers like me have some safety and stability in our lives. We work hard every day to keep New York running and now when this law passes, we will be able to take care of ourselves as well. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Jordani Bueno. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to address you today to, on an issue that's so vital to all working New Yorkers. I've worked at LaGuardia Airport for the past eight years as a wheelchair agent. It is hard backbreaking work that is often stressful. You should be there to see the scramble when uh, a flight disgorges scores of people tired from their journey, some of them sick, all of them anxious to get home or to their destinations in the city. It is the job of my coworkers and I to take care of these travelers and make sure their passage to the airports are safe. The last time I took off, I went to the Dominican Republic for the first time in 10 years. I got to see my grandparents. Uh, I saw my younger cousins who didn't recognize me anymore. It had been such a, a long time. That hurt because we used to be so close. Now I'm, I was just a stranger after 10 years. Though I'd been fortunate to retain my job, the loss of income meant it took time to catch up with my bills and I had to do without some things so I could pay the rent and keep a roof over my head. The, the, Dominic, the Dominican Republic is, is still feels like home to me and I wish I had paid time off to be able to, uh, to go back more. A law like this would be a godsend for me and my family. My coworkers and I will appreciate it very much, the safety and stability in our lives that this law will provide. Thank you. Hello. Good morning. I'm testifying on behalf of the airport workers. My name is Pedro Gamboa Bermudez. Hello, everyone. My name is Pedro Gamboa Bermudez. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I have worked at JFK Airport for the past nine years as a baggage handler. I have a 93-year-old who lives in Guatemala, Central America. She gets sick, and I want to be able to go to take care of her. If I do decide to take the unpaid time off, I don't know how my bills will be paid when I return. When I come back, I have to juggle my bills, pay, pay some, and hold the others 
to the next month until I'm able to catch up. Living paycheck to paycheck. I never know if I'm going to come back and be homeless. For the most part, taking days of having been worth the risk of become homeless or go without food. I know so many others who are in this situation and it shouldn't be like this. I applaud everyone who working in this law. I'm doing what is right for the workers. This will be a help for millions of people in New York City. We appreciate that a lot of you have been with us as we fought for higher wages, for more protection in the airport. I'm grateful for the city council that passed a law that gives us five days pay sick days, but we need more. My co-workers and I are need safety and stability in our lives. This law will provide help to all of us. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Sahid Bakas, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all today about an issue that is very important to the quality of life of New Yorkers. Having time off from work without worrying about losing income, it's like I need to protect me and my family is a huge deal for working people like me in New York City. I have worked at JFK Airport for 11 years as a security officer. I have tr three children who all live in different states and four grandchildren. I do not have paid days off to go see them. Everyone needs time off to see their family. When my mother died last year, I had to beg my boss for unpaid time off. Because I did not get paid when I was off work, I do not know if I would be able to pay my bills when I return. For the most part, taking days off and have not been worth the risk. It has been an impossible dream. We need time off to simply rest our bodies. We need to be able to recuperate so we can be protective, so we can be productive when we are on the job. So I am here to pledge my support to this legislation because it will help so many workers like me have safety and stability in our life. We work hard every day to keep New York running, and hopefully now we will be able to take care of ourselves as well. Thank you. I'm Rabbi Joshua Stanton here with my son, Jonah Kurzer, and I wanted to provide a different perspective because what I hear most from congregants and community members in my office is about exhaustion and burnout about broken lives, broken relationships, broken families, because they simply do not have time. And I'm here in support of paid leave because I'm someone with the privilege to have it, currently finishing parental leave and about ready to transition to a little bit of paid vacation so I can spend yet more time with my son. And the amount of brokenness, the amount of suffering that is caused by the absence of time off is staggering and something that I see each and every day as a rabbi and each and every day in the lives of so many colleagues in ministry and in other areas of service like this. In Jewish tradition, one of the most important requirements is the Sabbath is Shabbat. It is the earliest, arguably, or one of the earliest labor laws in existence anywhere. And it is a requirement that people not be penalized and be given one day off per week of paid leave to do as they so choose to be with their families, to be with their friends, to rejuvenate and recuperate so that they can contribute still more to society. And I think that learning from this example and expanding upon it is the need for paid leave for all workers in our city. Now this is a requirement in Jewish tradition, not merely for those who are Jewish, but actually for everybody, because it's understood that we need one law in society and that paid time off is of sacred importance. Thank you very much. Public advocate. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming here to share your stories. Uh, I want to make sure Mr. Gab Gaboa Bermudez, one of, part of your testimony cut off, so I wanted to make sure it was clear on the record that you have a 93-year-old mother 
who lives in Guatemala. That's the person you, you were speaking about. Um, I just wanted to know if, if any of you had any idea of, about how many employers are in the company you work for, many. roughly. My company. Employees, I'm sorry, employees here. My company at the airport actually have like 180 employees at the moment in one terminal. I'd say about the same thing for my company, about um, 100 or nearly 200 employees at one terminal. All right. I think we have like 900 or 1,000. Wow. Uh, we have about, let's say 350 at JFK, Terminal 7. 15 or 50? 350. 350. 350. I'm, I'm sorry that um, these companies sound, they, they don't sound, they sound pretty much bigger than small businesses. And so I'm sad that we have these size companies that uh, are not offering the basic that employers, employees need. I'm, I'm hoping that they, as, as we'll hear, they're not the, the majority of employees. I think employers do want to do what's right. It doesn't sound like yours or one of them, though. So hopefully when we get this bill passed, that will provide some relief that's needed from you. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, uh, you Mr. Mind, Public uh, Advocate. My company is one of the largest security companies in the United States of America, Allied Universal. Of, of, of course. and and, and um, uh, Council Member Orridge can appreciate because many of not only is JFK in our respective districts, but employ many folks from our communities. And I remember doing a low wage uh, uh, airport worker hearing about five years ago now, and, and workers would testify um, about having to make a decision on public transportation. Uh, walking to work to save money or eating lunch and things of that nature. And I see five years later, things have not changed much. And um, that is kind of the conundrum that we find ourselves in, whether or not we as government have to legislate. And obviously it's, it's, it's up to, as, and I want to commend 32BJ for this persistent and consistent fight for, for airport workers um, to, to raise those standards. And we as a body, as a society, cannot give in to bad players. And, and <laughs> this industry has a, a bunch of uh, subcontracted bad players and, and, and airlines themselves have proven themselves in many occasions to be so because they are accepting of this type of um, conduct when it comes to workers. And certainly um, it is important to hear the testimony of this workers, these workers here today to, to speak very specifically to an industry that obviously does not value workers. And Commission, I'm glad to, to see that you're sitting up front. And, and obviously, um, this is a target audience. And it's certainly an audience that does not require any of those uh, subsidies or further compensation for for employers that, that we were speaking about earlier, that this is just a industry in which they have to be forced to do the right thing. And unfortunately, we cannot educate, and in this case, you have to legislate and uh, for workers to have to make choices on, on eating or, or having money for public transportation to get to work and some of the stories that we continue to hear about workers within this industry is an absolute travesty. And, and certainly we're gonna be paying more attention to that in the future, but thank you so much for your testimony. Rabbi, thank you for your testimony and your support of workers as well. So, next panel. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Adira Simon. Excuse me, Jessica Walker, Samara from Brooklyn Chamber, Maria Diaz, and Jay Pelts.
Um, please turn your mic on, identify yourself. Good morning, Chair Miller and Public Advocate Williams. Um, I am Samara Karasik, Chief Policy Officer of the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce. The Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce is among the largest and most influential business advocacy organizations in New York, having spent the last 100 years developing and promoting policies that drive economic development and advance its members' interests. We're the voice of the Brook Brooklyn's business community, offering resources, programs, tools, and support services for businesses to continue creating jobs and opportunities in our communities. The Brooklyn Chamber supports strengthening worker protections. Our businesses care about their workers having good work-life balance and earning a living that supports their families. They fundamentally believe in the concept of paid time off for employees. However, we cannot support this bill. Our member businesses are currently facing so many regulatory and economic challenges that it is threatening their ability to survive. The proposed legislation would mandate that employers with five or more employees be required to provide employees with up to 10 days of paid personal time off annually. Small businesses feel every additional cost keenly because they do not have a cushion to absorb it. This new mandate would have a devastating impact on the small businesses that are the backbone of this city. On top of recently passed legislation increasing minimum wage, requiring paid sick leave, rising rents, and the cost and complexity of regulatory violations, our members cannot take one more cost on top of their already thin profit margins. Member businesses have relayed to us their concerns that this legislation will make it difficult to maintain current staffing levels. They may be forced to eliminate positions, as some already have, and will not be able to offer robust training programs under these conditions. We are concerned that this legislation will push many businesses Businesses to circumstances where they will be unable to function and to ultimately shut down or move their production outside of New York City. This bill needs to look at the overall picture of all the bills and regulations that have recently gone into effect and consider the additional burden this would cause. The Brooklyn Chamber is very focused on job creation that enables our community residents and businesses to all thrive. This bill would prevent our economy from continuing to grow good paying jobs and much needed training opportunities for our local workers. We cannot require 10 days of paid time off for workers without tying it to relief for small businesses so that they can maintain their businesses and continue to grow both their bottom lines and the number of jobs they create. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on Introduction 800A. Thank you, Chair Miller, distinguished council members, and public advocate Williams for affording an opportunity for a hearing on the mandatory earn safe and sick time laws. My name is Maria Diaz, and I am the executive director of the Greenwich Village Chelsea Chamber of Commerce. With the recent adjustments to minimum wage, paid sick, and family leave, small businesses are not only struggling to incorporate these new costs onto their books, they are also struggling with, an understanding, with understanding the ever-increasing complexities of taxes, fees, and regulations. These mandates are an added burden as entrepreneurs cannot reinvest in their business and workforce and instead have to divert resources to hire further regulatory expertise, pay fines, deal with mounds of piling paperwork, or in the worst case or cases, lay off workers. Moreover, these mandates have been put into effect in such rapid sequence that our businesses sim simply cannot keep up with this onslaught of changes. Rather than bombarding businesses with more policies, government should allow our overburdened entrepreneurs to adjust accordingly to keep their operations afloat. Increasing rents and vacancy storefronts in our neighborhoods are a big concern. In the heart of our footprint, we've heard of Bleecker Street's unhealthy vacancy rate of over 20%. Government should be finding mechanisms to alleviate these pressures, such as reforming the city's property tax laws, a major factor in the rising cost of doing business in New York. Starting and maintaining a business comes with incredibly high risks. New York City must encourage, not inhibit, this entrepreneurial spirit. We believe that the law being discussed today, while in good faith, should not be a priority. Let us focus on reducing and streamlining the growing number of rules and regulations on our businesses, our small businesses. Our message is simple. Refocus on what really matters. Encourage an entrepreneurial climate where businesses can thrive for the sake of their owners, employees, and the consumers they serve. Ensure a thriving economy for all and not in my written testimony, I still have 55 seconds, um, is the numbers that the, serve, that the 
report that was quoted earlier was, I believe, only a sample size of 352 businesses. My organization represents a vast majority of businesses that have five or less employees, and the sample size would be only 49 businesses that were sampled to represent the businesses that have one to five employees. So I don't think the sample size was accurate. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Jessica Walker, the president of the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce, and um, we represent almost 1,700 uh, businesses here in Manhattan, in the region, really, um, the vast majority of which are small businesses. Um, I want to agree with uh, the things we've already heard here. There's no doubt about it that it's a tough time for small businesses. This legislation in particular is really going to uh, affect retail and restaurants, which is just really bad timing for them right now. Um, in addition to the minimum wage increase and the things that we've, we've heard about here. Um, obviously, the retail sector is going through a mass uh, transition at the moment, and so we're seeing all of these vacancies because they're trying to figure things out and, and be able to compete. Uh, so this would just be another whammy um, in that, in that, uh, to that extent. Um, and then with restaurants, we're starting to see for the first time in 10 years a decline um, uh, in terms of job losses among restaurants. Um, part of that because of the minimum wage, but there are other factors there as well. There's also at the state level um, the threat of uh, eliminating the tipped wage, um, which is a basically it would, it would drive up, if that was, were to happen, it would really drive up payroll costs substantially. And so that coupled with um, the paid vacation mandate would really be devastating uh, to restaurants, which of course would have an impact on tourism. Um, so I think there's a lot of different things there. Um, the other thing I will say is I wanted to just, uh, Maria brought up the issue of paid sick leave. I think I don't want to take it for granted that we didn't see an impact from it. Um, I think there's the report, definitely take a look at the methodology. I do think that the report is shoddy um, and shouldn't be taken as, you know, sort of gold um, that, that we probably do need to do another, another study here in the city to really examine that. Um, and then the other thing is, I think that we did see um, when the when paid sick leave was um, enacted, and then we finally were employees were able to accrue, and then when they were finally able to uh, start taking time off, we did see a spike in the um, regional cost of eating out. So I think that there was an impact there for consumers and restaurants. Um, happy to happy to share that with you as well. Um, but long story short, I do think that this is something that we really need to examine. I hope that the city council will not rush it through, that we really um, pr have additional opportunities to hear from small businesses and the potential impact, because I, do, I really do think this is uh, potentially very harmful. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Jay Peltz, and I'm the general counsel and senior vice president of government relations for the Food Industry Alliance of New York. FIA is a nonprofit trade association that advocates on behalf of grocery, drug, and convenience stores. Neighborhood grocers have never faced a more difficult operating environment. Food price inflation is minimal, while operating expenses soar due partly to high rents and the $15 minimum wage. Legislation that would authorize the issuance of up to 4,450 new food vending permits and mandate the establishment of 20 single carter zones for the collection of solid waste will, if passed and signed into law, reduce sales and increase costs further. Accordingly, regulatory burdens are squeezing neighborhood grocers while non-union, non-traditional retailers such as internet sellers, warehouse clubs, natural organics retailers, and dollar stores are taking market share from neighborhood grocers. These circumstances are making it increasingly difficult for neighborhood grocers to net even a penny on the dollar. Traditional grocers have shut their doors while food deserts are present throughout the city. Unfortunately, the highly disruptive nature of this legislation will likely result in more rather than fewer food deserts in the city. The cost of this bill will be substantial. The Washington Examiner has provided an analysis of the projected cost of the proposal. Quote, the mayor estimates his plan would affect 500,000 workers in the city. Government statistics say the average hourly salary is about $42 for the mid-Atlantic region, and applying that figure to eight-hour shifts for 10 working days would yield a cost of $1.67 billion. Clearly, the city's neighborhood grocers cannot afford such a mandate. Accordingly, to ensure that these small businesses remain viable and can make payroll, we respectfully request that businesses with fewer than 50 employees be exempt from the paid personal time law provisions of the bill. In addition, grocery stores' busiest season is from mid-November through January 1. The significant use of paid personal time off during this season would undermine the viability of neighborhood grocery stores. 
However, the provisions of proposed section 2914C3 regarding the denial of a request for paid personal time off, combined with expanded provisions pro prohibiting retaliation, make it likely that a significant number of employees will take paid time off during the holidays when people prefer to be home with their families or away on vacation rather than working. To avoid this outcome, we respectfully request that section 2914C3 be deleted in its entirety and be replaced with a negotiated framework that better balances the interests of employers and employees. We respectfully request that intro 800A be held in committee while the foregoing issues are discussed. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chair Miller, for the opportunity to testify. My name is Adira Simon from the Partnership for New York City. We represent employers of a million private sector workers in the city. The partnership opposes proposed intro 800A as an imposition on the decision of what benefits private sector employers will provide their employees. Adding 10 vacation days to the five mandated paid sick days would triple the amount of paid time off for New York City employees. It would require little or no notice to employers and would substantially add to the administrative and cost burdens that the city and state have placed on employers. These burdens are particularly difficult for small businesses to bear. They do not have legal departments to interpret new laws or human resource professionals to manage the compliance and record keeping for new mandates. Empty storefronts, which the council is concerned with, are a symbol of the impact of a less friendly business climate in the city. This is in part a result of the growing cost of new mandates, ranging from increased minimum wage to new scheduling restrictions and new training requirements that employers must comply with. Most large employers provide paid time off, often more than would be mandated under the proposed legislation. But every company has different practices with respect to how and when this leave is taken, depending on their individual business requirements. Also, most large employers have operations outside the city and their leave policies are difficult to change in response to local law. There's no clear reason why the city council should impose a single paid time off policy on all New York City employers. Certainly, the specific prescriptions in this bill leave little room for policies that reflect the needs of individual businesses or the extent of the hardship that this may impose on some employers. We recognize the political impetus for the legislation and urge that if you are moving forward, the law exempt businesses with fewer than 20 employees and all those employers who certify that they are already providing at least 15 days of paid time off pursuant to collective bargaining agreements or their own benefit arrangements. This would at least mitigate the negative impact of the bill. Thank you. Public advocate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all for um, your testimony. A um, few questions. Um, someone mentioned that the study only had 49 businesses with employees less than five. Who was that? Um, what is the sample size you think would be the best to? I wouldn't know a number to quote. I just don't think that 49 is, is appropriate. Uh, I mean, it might be. I don't know what the number. Right. I don't know where those are. businesses, like the spread of those businesses. Um, in my in my district, I'm, I only represent Greenwich Village and Chelsea, South Manhattan. I can I can probably secure a significant number of businesses that would be in a. a I know when posters are doing <clears> this kind of stuff, they usually they usually have a remarkably, I think, small amount of people that they then extrapolate. Um, to okay. everyone else. So it, it might in fact be enough. I, I don't know, but I was interested to hear okay. what you thought. Um, and uh, I guess almost everybody mentioned things about most large employers already provide paid time off. I'm not, it doesn't sound like a persuasive argument not to do this, so I'm not sure what the, what the argument is. If most em employers already do it, that's great. We're trying to focus on the ones um, that don't do it. Um, there are a few things that also that uh, the partnership, I think your testimony, there was no clear reason why the city council should impose a single paid time off on all New York City employees. You also said that every company has different practices with respect to how and when this leave is taken. Um, I also don't think that's necessarily persuasive. We, we definitely need to have on some of these things some consistency so that uh, when people go to different jobs and different places, there's some constant about what they can expect to get when they, when they go. Uh, as you've heard testimony, <clears throat> There's plenty of abuse going on 
um, and from, from even large businesses. And I've heard of people who have um, their employers are actually just mixing up paid sick with other things. So I think some consistency uh, definitely is needed uh, when we discuss this. Um, I, I, I am, as always, concerned about the impacts of our, of our legislation on small business. I mentioned I had a small business, so I am trying to find ways uh, to help mitigate some of it. I don't think 50 employees or 20 employees or less uh, uh, is realistic uh, to the people that, that we want to cover. I, I'm also not persuaded by the administration that five is the number. I, I would like to see it a little higher so folks can think about what that could be. I'd like to hear that as well. And partnership, I think you mentioned um, if you pass the bill, small businesses would need some additional support. I would like to know what kind of support that would look like because but I agree this um, administration has in my opinion failed to provide much support to small business in general even as we're passing these bills that frankly we should pass I mean um, I'm, I'm sad that we always have to go to employer versus employee but, but there are a lot a lot of employees out there and they have to have our protection uh, as well um, we see the impacts when that is not happening but I concurrently believe that we have to be doing a lot more for our small businesses and, and our smaller employers, which we are not. So if there's some ideas, um, uh, um, Samara or anyone else actually, of what that support can look like as we're doing this, I would love to hear it. No, so I, I just wanted to start with the, the, what supports would be needed for business. Obviously, I think, um, Councilman Ulrich um, spoke about, you know, if this is if there's such a moral imperative for this, that the city should be able to try to help subsidize it, um, and I think that's right. Or at least try to find some offsets that would allow um, small businesses to be able to provide this benefit without, you know, uh, putting themselves out of business. I mean, just peripherally, when I had a brief outside meeting, I brought up that exactly. That didn't seem to be something that people thought would be administrated properly. I brought up actually a fund uh, like that, possibly well, the same amount of similar kind of money we would have given Amazon to put together a fund to give to businesses that will create five or more jobs or something like that. I don't know if there's interest in something like that. It seemed like there perhaps there wasn't, so. Well, I think part of it is um, an, an incentive to create new jobs is different from providing additional benefits, right, to the employees that they already have and being able to just, you know, not go underwater. How? That's part of how, it. How logistically, magically we have $25 billion. How, how do you get that to a small business? And it could be in the form of tax relief. I mean, there's probably tax different relief. things that could, could happen. Um, we've always been fighting, this is a Manhattan-specific issue, um, but the commercial rent tax, um, the city council made a change, I think, two or three years ago, and it's already, even with that change in place, it's expected to bring in an additional hundred million dollars this fiscal year than it did two or three years ago so you know where does it end it's it's um, there are lots of different ways and lots of different places where I think that we could we could look I mean at. I do see how you know the increase minimum wage paid sick uh, how that can look and this could look uh, like it's layering but I do think the issues of rent and taxes are more damaging to, to small businesses um, than these things that we're trying to put forth? Um, it, just the example that I'll give is the coffee shop, which recently closed. Um, there's no question about it. The, the rent is um, going up in Union Square. There's no question about it. But they um, did say that because of the increase in the minimum wage, um, that their payroll was going to be going up $46,000 per month just based off the minimum wage. So payroll costs are real. I, I definitely. I from having owned, I, I understand. <laughs> right. But I also know rent and taxes are equally. It's, it's, it's the cumulative uh, impact though. Yeah. And so it's adding all of these things. But we have to make sure that we're looking out for the employees as well. And even, I mean, I, I often, myself, kind of the dichotomy of the privilege that I have, making sure that I recognize that. But, but even if someone doesn't have it, getting 750, even if you have that job and still unable to pay your rent, still unable to buy food, and possibly having to go to a homeless shelter, I don't know that that's a good thing either. So uh, that's things that we have to grapple with as, we, as we're trying to move forward with these things. All right, so from the grocery industry's perspective, the commercial rent tax 
uh, is something that needs to be looked at. Uh, the food vending permit bill is a big problem. The transition away from market-based collection of solid waste and receivables is a big problem. But bigger in terms of the bigger picture, we need to do um, we need to convene some sort of a commission or mechanism that does a top-down review of the rules and the regs that are imposed on businesses in the city uh, because it's going one way and not the other. And those rules impose hidden taxes um, and something's gotta give in the long run. Uh, I think it's already happening already. Um, and that's not going to help preserve jobs in the city. Uh, Overregulating will decrease jobs in the city. So we need a collaborative effort to rationalize regulations so that we can better balance the interests of employers and, and employees. Um, those who recommended 20 20 employees or less, 50 employees or less. Was this similar to what you proposed for paid sick? Uh, no, we did not. Okay. Any more? We were recommending 20. I, I don't know that we had that conversation under paid sick. Um, uh, I also did, I mean, I did find persuasive the, um, the amount of days needed, so I, I do want to um, look into that a little bit more. I think it was. Uh, the food industry, yeah. Uh, the amount of days that are needed to, to make sure that, every, that everything goes into impact, uh, in effect. Uh, I, I do want to look at that some more, so I'm happy to look at that. Um, I do want to, lastly, the administration put forth that the consistency issue of keeping it at five so that employers uh, can best have the best opportunity to apply the law uh, and not be confused, I guess. I'd just like a response to that, and they want one of the one of the issues. It's the several. One of them is that it's easier for the employer if this law matches the already existing paid sick law. So, can we have some comment on that? Of course, uh, acknowledging you don't want it to happen to begin with, <laughs> but um, in the, in the world where I believe, and I'm happy that it may be moving forward. I'd like to understand. Well, that, that I mean, not to be funny, but that's what I was going to say. For those who survive, um, yes, it would be. Uh, potentially easier because of the, the existing system. But um, again, starting it at a five is very low. Um, I would just add, I think that when we're making policy, and, and I appreciate that you're listening to the feedback from everybody here today, we should be taking into account what's going to work for small businesses and workers and make sure that those good jobs that the small businesses are trying to create can stay there. So we should start from, from that place. Um, with all the complex regulatory environment in New York City, I, I don't think that's the thing for us. It's that our small businesses can survive and employ workers and give the business, you know, ha provide that customer service that we all want as New Yorkers. So uh, I will say, usually when I hear Armageddon is going to happen, I generally don't believe it. Like I think we're in a bad space, and whatever we do or don't do, there are people who are going to be harmed whether it's workers or employees, employers. And I get that. I mean, if we do nothing right now, someone's going to be harmed. If we do something, someone is going to be harmed. We just want to find the most impact, the best impact for the most people while harming the least amount of folks. And so uh, that's why I always come from. I, I do think, you know, passing this, there may be some employers that get harmed. We want to try to mitigate that as much as possible. I think not passing it, there's other things that might harm employers. Um, but we know now there are a whole host of employees that are being harmed mentally and physically because they cannot have this time off. We had stories of people having to beg their employer just for time off to go see their mom. These are happening in the rate of thousands right now. So something has to be done. Um, I do want to just drill it again, just to understand in, in your words, for those who survive, I don't think it'll be that Armageddon, but if for those who, in your words, survive, you do think keeping it at five is best for consistency for them? Is that what you're saying? So I usually start at, it's a little higher than that because of what Adir brought up. That a lot of small businesses don't have an HR department to begin with, right? So it's the CEO who is doing everything, um, all of the back, house, back of house operations, and they're doing their own books. Um, so sure, but it's not, it's not ideal under paid sick leave in that scenario because they don't have the HR support. Um, so yeah, sure, if they're linked together, um, yes, but again, like I said, that that means you're capturing very small businesses and um, it's adding another burden to the CEO who's doing everything. Right, so from our perspective, I mean, they're used to 
inconsistencies and differences in rules and regs all the time. So the differences can be tracked. It's not, we shouldn't make it five across the board just to make it quote unquote easier from that perspective. That's not really the issue. Does is anybody else want, want to comment on that? I just also keep in mind, which is interesting to me, and it doesn't include family. So uh, if we're talking about the mom and pop shop, it doesn't include mom and pop. And I don't think it'll include their, their children. So that does help mitigate some of it a little bit. But sorry. I was going to say that Jessica mentioned CEO, but I'm thinking of all my small businesses, like the, the couple who just went out of business because the, the, the rising rent and be, that is affected by taxes and they couldn't afford to hire an employee. So they work seven days a week. So they, you know, that, that this wouldn't apply to them. They can't pay, they weren't paying themselves salary. So there are several small businesses that employ, employ employers, employees that are not the large, you know, 200, 300, 900 businesses. I'm, we're, I represent the smaller businesses that um, this is gonna have a negative, negative effect on. So for those small business who I will assume probably don't want this to pass. If we're doing it, is it better if it's five consistent with paid sick? Or is it, does it make a difference if it's not five and it's uh, a higher amount? Well, originally it was at 10, but the administration put forth that consistency was an issue so that the mom and pops that you're speaking about can administer the law in a better, in a better way. I'm trying to find out if that is an accurate description I, I can't imagine why just keeping it consistent will make it better because keeping increasing the number five will capture less of the small businesses that I represent. So I don't think consistency is a necessary factor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Public Advocate. Um, so all of you represent different organizations and, and, and chambers throughout the city. Uh, what has your collective data that has showed in terms of um, costs associated with, with the latest policies? And, and specifically, if there is any cost, additional costs associated, has that cost been passed on to consumer? Well, in, in the grocery industry, the, the competition is, uh, is fierce. So it's very difficult. Uh, there's very little food price inflation um, in terms of food consumed at home. So increasingly, profits are being squeezed. And that's the situation that we want to avoid. It's not a matter of the sky falling. It's a matter of if this bill is passed as is and signed into law, there will be adverse impacts because employers are going to have to find a way to pay for it, um, and that's then that's something that we want to avoid. And anyone else? It's, it's hard to answer just because it's so different in different industries how that how that all how that all works. But I will say just across the board, we do uh, an annual uh, survey of our members, and there's no question about it. The biggest challenge that they are facing right now is the cost of doing business here in the city. Obviously, that applies to a lot of different things, um, but when we did, uh, when we dug deeper, um, there's no question about it that the that regulations, taxes, those things um, were brought up a lot more than even real estate issues. Um, I'm happy to share that with you, but um, but that's you know that's sort of again that's more of a across the board. Um, I would just say I have had businesses tell me they can't pass it along. There's only so much that you can charge for a cup of coffee or a baked good. Um, we have seen, um, and I think this was raised in some of the restaurants, that because of all of the new regulations, they have increased some costs. But again, there's only so much they can pass along to customers and that customers will be okay with. And you know, they don't really want to have to pass the cost along to customers. Um, they want to be able to provide you know, good service at a good price and also you know, treat their employees well. If I could follow up, so then if, if it's not being passed through, then profit is being squeezed. And over time, that means fewer stores, that means less jobs, lower pay raises, et cetera, less benefits. So that's, that's, a, that's a cycle we want to avoid. So, um, yeah, and, 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 and then there is, um, I, and I know you ref represent a, a broad diversity of, of industries as well, what, what I'm not seeing are those low-wage workers that are losing jobs to automation. 
um, be, be, because of this as well. They're not, like I don't walk into a small business and not hear some semblance of, of concern. And um, I'm hopeful that this dialogue will be able to somehow uh, address and, and be able to mitigate some of those concerns. But certainly when you go into uh, uh, fast foods and, 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 and there's automation and, and kiosks is happening instead of people and that, you know, are we achieving our goal of, of what is our target universe for creating a quality, a better quality of life for workers if in fact we're reducing the number of the workers and, you know, how, how do we really achieve this goal at the same time uh, and, and being a, a effective? Um, certainly there are industries, you know, whether you're getting your car washed or you're doing other things, you know, 21 bucks, 22 bucks is, is a lot of money. Um, and, and that certainly has, has been passed on. Um, but there's also specific industries, I think, that whether they're represented here or not, we, we need to have a, a more detailed conversation about how do we provide these benefits to the workers within those industries. At the same time, um, providing the technical support, some of the backroom stuff that we were, you, you were talking about, that you mentioned, um, in terms of how do you manage this new workforce, these new numbers that you now have to deal with where there's no collective bargaining agreement or there's no regulations governing the usage and, and what impact that will have on small businesses. I, I, I'd really like for you all that represent these hundreds of thousands of businesses to consider these uh, some of these thoughts and ideas so that we can come back and have a really really intelligent conversation about how we move this thing forward, because there's no doubt that it, that it absolutely needs to move forward. But what I'm hearing is, is, is very generic. And when I'm on the ground going into restaurants and going into car washes and going to laundry mats, that the day-to-day -day stuff that every New Yorker does, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing stories that you guys aren't necessarily, and I, I know you represent these businesses, some um, maybe not in my district, um, but I, I, there's a little consistency um, missing in, in the narrative and how it gets told. I, I, you know, I was in a, a business and they gave me a letter when the, in which they testified over paid sick and they, they, they wanted to kind of amend it and, and to bring it in here. But there's also, what are the, um, is, are there any additional costs associated with higher payrolls for businesses? Well, higher payrolls means higher payroll taxes, for one. Higher payroll taxes, you, you have to pay insurances, business insurance, unemployment insurance, workers' compensation insurance. Has, has there been, those, because some of that is government regulated, not necessarily the city, but the state, right? If, in fact, we're imposing, um, increase fees in one way um, on the businesses, there can be a way for government then to kind of reduce those, you know, to, to can, can we have the conversation about the cost of, of these mandated um, uh, provisions that, that are associated with it, right? Like, you know, the the workers' comp and the, and, and the other things that, that go along with employing of, of folks. Have, have we considered that or is that not? Because when I talk to small businesses, they, when, when I talk to them, when they offer to me, when I'm just sitting down to, to have a cup of tea, that, you know, here's what's going on in their lives and their business by virtue of, of these policies. I, I'm expecting to hear you guys articulate that and, and so that we can go back with, with the admin and the members of council and, and really try to be able to drill down and address these issues. Specifically, where can we be supportive? What does that support look like? And, and I think that's where we want to get to.
Just let it marinate. No, no, no. I just don't worry I, about it. We don't have to answer it now, okay. but we, we're going to definitely. I think the commissioner and the admin and their team have, are committed to further conversation. We don't have a lot of time because this needs to get done. Um, but I, that is certainly something to consider, so we can put all this in the pot and and, and come up with something uh, that is 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 suitable um, for everyone involved. Thank you. Okay, so thank you all, and we're going to call the next panel. Irene Lowe, Marina James, Jackie Ori, Marcella Cocolatos. Bam. Okay, just uh, turn your mic on and identify yourself before giving your testimony, and thank you all for coming out. Good morning, my name is Jackie Ori, and I am an organizer in New York City with the National Domestic Workers Alliance, NDWA. NDWA is home to the growing care and cleaning workforce that go to work in American homes supporting families. We are a powerful alliance of over 60 affiliate organizations and three local chapters in 36 cities and 17 states. We are in regular contact with over 230,000 nannies, house cleaners, and caregivers to the elderly and people with disabilities. For the past year, I have outreached several hundred domestic workers and supported many to come forward to enforce their worker rights through our domestic worker rights clinic. As workers come through our legal clinic, we learn many domestic workers do not get paid vacation time, paid personal time, or paid sick days. I migrated to the United States from St. Lucia in 1999. In my very first job as a domestic worker, I only got one week vacation when my employers were traveling. I was paid only part of that time. I did not get paid sick leave. With the families I worked with later, I started to negotiate and receive at least two weeks paid vacation a year. I had one employer for whom I worked for five years who traveled a lot. We negotiated paid time off that coincided with their travel. I would get an average of six weeks vacation a year, paid vacation. In my next job, we agreed on five sick days, two weeks vacation, and five personal days, all paid. And currently in my part-time nannying job, I work 24 hours a week. We have agreed on two weeks paid vacation and a minimum of five paid sick days a year. I have had employers who have been fair, valued my work, and considered me important enough to have vacation time and rest time. This made a difference in my life. I went back to work, I went back to school full time and I worked full time as a nanny to get my degree. It went a long way to ensuring I had enough time to study for imp important exams. Okay, I'm gonna have to cut it for lack of time. Paid time off has allowed me the freedom to live my life fully. This is so important for domestic workers. We do very stressful work and work very long hours. And just like other workers, we need time to care for ourselves and to recover our energy in order to bring our best to our jobs. At some point in our lives, we may all need care. Paid personal time is critical to our mental and emotional health, and this is a human right. Thank you.
My name is Marina James, and I'm a proud leader of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, NDWA. NDWA is a home growing care for cleaning workforces that goes to work in America homes supporting families. I migrated to the US from St. Lucia in 1994. I have worked as a domestic worker for 11 families in New York and Connecticut since 1995. My job duties normally include childcare, light housekeeping, and running occasional errands. I am a single mother. I have a daughter born in 2000. And throughout her life, I found it so difficult to balance being there for her in all ways I wanted. While I was meeting my employer's unrealistic expectation for my job, when my daughter was a baby, I would drop her off 7 a.m. in the morning with a childcare provider and not seen her until 7.30 or later in the evening. When she was of school age, it was very similar. I would pick her up after getting off work, which is past the bedtime I would like for her. Getting home, I would give her a bath and put her to sleep and prepare things for the next day. I never really got time to spend with her. On top of this, I had to teach my daughter at a very early age to travel to school and stay home alone. Often, I would worry about her safety while at work. It was often not possible to attend events and conference, and conference meeting at my daughter's school, and I could not be involved as I would have liked. My employer never accommodated me, never considered supporting me to be a mother I wanted to be. I never gotten paid personal time of my, of my choosing as a domestic worker. While I, heard of, while I heard and knew other domestic workers who negotiated paid sick time, federal holidays, and vacation, I never felt like I was in a work situation where I had a voice. My employer always communicated in their needs were more, that were more important than mine, both their words and action. Occasionally, I would have time when my employer were going on their vacation. I sometimes got paid for some of the time, but often I did not get paid at all. Most recent employer refused to pay me for vacation when I traveled, reasoning that I had to pay for another child care provider when she travels. In the summer, winter, this would especially set me back. I couldn't rely on bringing income I normally would ensure to provide for my daughter. As a single mother, working and keeping my job was essential and surviving to raising my daughter. I felt I could not speak for fear of losing my job. Today, I feel differently. This bill made paid personal time a right for New York City workers to have major positive impact on domestic workers. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you to the committee and to the public advocate for this opportunity to, test to testify. My name is Marcella Cocolatos, and I'm a staff attorney at A Better Balance, a national nonprofit legal advocacy organization based here in New York. A Better Balance drafted the majority of the nation's paid sick leave laws, and we are proud to support this bill, which would amend the city's sick and safe leave law to give workers an additional right to paid personal time off. Shockingly, the U.S. is the only advanced economy in the world that does not guarantee its workers paid vacation. Member countries of the European Union are required to provide at least 20 paid vacation days, but some exceed that floor, including France, which provides 30, and the United Kingdom, which provides 28. Indeed, with no federal, state, or local law other than the newly passed law in Maine requiring employers to provide paid vacation time, the U.S. is woefully out of step with all of its peers on this issue. And unsurprisingly, the paid vacation that U.S. employers do make available voluntarily is distributed unequally. Most low-wage and part-time workers do not have paid vacation. Small business employees are also less likely to have this benefit. With this bill, the Council has shown once again that New York City is a national leader in the movement to advance the rights and well-being of working families. The bill will benefit workers' health and businesses' bottom line, as studies have shown that taking personal time off can improve one's health and longevity as well as employees' productivity. That said, we do have several concerns with the bill as presently drafted that we must raise. While all are laid out in our written testimony, I want to focus on one in particular at this time concerning enforcement. The proposed bill does not contain a private right of action that would enable workers to vindicate their rights in court. New York City's enforcement is lagging far behind the other jurisdictions in the U.S. with paid sick leave laws. Over two-thirds of the 30-plus sick leave laws in the U.S. include a private right of action, including Westchester. 
We know firsthand from our direct services work that exclusive agency enforcement harms workers in several significant ways. First, we have seen agency cases languish, some dragging on for years, and workers are left paying the price. Second, the priorities of the agency and the complaining worker do not always align, leaving workers confused, disempowered, and often without the full relief that they may have received by going to court. Third, without a private right of action, workers who experience other labor abuses, such as minimum wage violations and discrimination, lack the ability to consolidate all of their claims in a single venue. This is both extremely burdensome for workers and an inefficient use of city resources. Lastly, while the proposal does authorize the Corporation Council to bring civil actions for violations of the law, this mechanism still leaves workers with no ability to vindicate their own rights as a party. Therefore, we urge the Council to add a provision to the proposed bill that will authorize workers to bring a civil action and ensure that New York City does not lag behind the majority of other cities and states with paid sick leave laws. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Irene Liu and I am a policy analyst at the Community Service Society. We have supported the expansion of protections and benefits for low-wage workers, including a lead role in efforts to pass the paid sick days law in New York City. I am testifying today in support of the paid personal time bill. I am a new mom and I am lucky enough to have at least two weeks of paid vacation a year, but many low-wage workers don't have a single paid vacation day. According to our 2018 Unheard Third survey, among New York City residents who would be covered by the paid personal time provision, only 34% of the working poor had paid vacation from their employers, compared to 82% of those with moderate to higher incomes. We also found that other employees who are least likely to have paid vacation days now in New York are those working part-time, those employed by small businesses, those working in the retail sector, or those relying on tips. These are all the workers that would benefit the most from, the, from having a guaranteed paid vacation law. My written testimony has more detail on these statistics, but I just want to note the importance of the bill co covering workers employed by firms with five or more employees, given the concerns that we've heard about small businesses today. Low-income workers are much more likely than those with moderate to higher incomes to be employed by small businesses and they are least likely to have coverage. According to our survey data, 52% of private sector workers in small businesses with five to 14 employees reported having paid vacation from their employers, while 80% of those working for employers of 50 or more did. Also, by covering employees at firms with at least five employees, paid personal time would also be easier to administer because the existing paid sick time law covers the same group of workers. I'd also like to briefly highlight some concerns we have with the proposed legislation. As written, the bill does not enable workers to actually accrue the intended 80 hours of personal time in a year. My written testimony has more information on this, but we do urge the City Council to consider establishing the same faster accrual rate for both personal sick time to make it easier for employees and employers to track accrued time, as well as streamline administration for employees. We'd also highlight we, I'd also like to highlight the concern we have about the paid personal time bill not enabling employers in restaurant and other tipped industries to pay tipped worker, th sorry, that it enables employers in the restaurant and other tipped industries to pay tipped workers a lower tipped minimum wage rather than the full minimum wage as required under the existing paid sick days law. We urge the City Council to correct the bill so that tipped workers are paid the full minimum wage for personal time and that the personal time pay rate for tipped workers is consistent with the sick time pay rate for these workers under the existing paid sick time law. We also urge the City Council to add a private right of action that would enable workers to vindicate their right in court. In closing, I'd just like to say that low-wage workers are the ones who can least afford to go without paid leave, but they are the ones who are most likely to lack this benefit. All working New Yorkers need paid personal time to spend with their families, address necessary demands outside of work, and recharge from the daily grind. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony um, and, and, and your suggestions uh, to improve the legislation as well. Um, your voice has definitely been heard, and obviously uh, your organization has been at the forefront for domestic workers for the past few years. I've had the pleasure of working with uh, the, the organization on a number of policy impacting the community. So look forward to um, hearing your voice as we move forward in, in future. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next panel, Blair Papagani. Kathleen Riley, 
Andrew Griggy, Robert Bookman, Nelson Asubio. And Matt Grilla. May begin. Uh, please begin by introducing yourself and turn on your mic. Sure. Into the mic. Thank you. Hello. Good morning, Chair Miller and other members of the committee. My name is Nelson Usebi. I'm the Director of Government Relations for the National Supermarket Association. The NSA Trade Association represents the interests of independent supermarket owners in New York and other urban cities throughout the East Coast, Mid Atlantic region, and Florida. In the five boroughs alone, we represent over 400 stores that employ over 15,000 New Yorkers. Our members work hard every day to run their business, support their families, provide jobs, healthy food options to their communities. I'm here today to testify on introduction 800A, a law requiring city employees to provide earned safe, sick, and personal time to employees. While we support the intent of the bill, we have some concerns surrounding the cost and perimeters of, the, of, of implementation. Many NSA members provide paid personal time for full-time employees. However, our members don't necessarily provide the same for part-time employees. Part-time work is inherently flexible in nature. In many cases, the employee scheduling around the employee's needs. The reality is, the reality is that many of our part-time employees are kids who apply for part-time work to make extra money to help their families, save for the future, and help some, have some spending cash. Requiring paid vacation for part-time employees will only serve to steer employers away from hiring part-time workers, which will undoubtedly impact young high school and college students. We hope that the City Council will consider exempting small businesses with 50 employees or less for having to provide paid personal time to part-time staff. Thank you for your consideration. I'm happy to answer any questions. Good afternoon, my name is Kathleen Riley. I am the New York City Government Affairs Coordinator for the New York State Restaurant Association. Restaurants are crucial to the economic and cultural fab fabric of New York City. They employ hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers, fuel tourism, and our many small immigrant-owned and minority and women-owned restaurants contribute to the vibrancy of our city. Restaurants provide important and sought after jobs, and many of the New Yorkers who choose employment in the restaurant industry do so for the flexibility, which allows them to also pursue their passions or attend to other responsibilities in their lives, such as school, parent, or child care. To ensure the continued viability of the restaurant industry, New York City must prioritize regulations that enable these hardworking New Yorkers to continue earning their livelihoods, and remember to consider this crucial industry when crafting wide-reaching policy. I'm here today to express opposition and concern over Intro 800A, which has been introduced by public advocate Williams. This proposal would require all employers in the city with five or more employees to provide paid personal time in addition to the paid sick and safe time, which is already required. Employees would accrue this time much like safe and sick leave. The New York State Restaurant Association is opposed to Intro 800A for reasons of both expense and scheduling burden. On the issue of expense, it seems almost every time NICER comes to testify before City Council, we make a point to contextualize new costly proposals in the current difficult climate for our industry in New York City. As the minimum wage has increased, and especially since the most recent wage hike at the new year, New York City is seeing its restaurant industry struggle. Employers are cutting jobs, decreasing hours, staffing as few people as it can manage while maintaining their standard of service, trying to cut costs, and often raising prices. On top of wage increases, employers contend with high rents and an ever-growing list of regulations which are costly to track and meet and even costlier to inadver inadvertently violate. In this environment, the city is looking to impose yet another mandated increase to employee compensation, and it isn't something the restaurant industry can afford. For a small restaurant employing just 20 people, this proposal would cost the employer at a minimum $24,000 more each year. There isn't $24,000 extra in the budget. 
a truth that City Council itself has acknowledged in the past when it, you passed the Awnings Act several months ago. If businesses didn't have $5,000 for an awnings fine, they certainly don't have $24,000 to pay for vacations. Putting this legislation into effect will cost jobs. Passing the legislation will effectively pad the compensation packages of some workers at the expense of others' jobs. And arguably, the people most at risk of losing their jobs in this situation might be the same vulnerable workers that you would be hoping to protect. And we would really not like to see that happen. Besides costs, our other major concern is scheduling burden. It's worth noting that the restaurant ind industry particularly attracts people seeking a flexible work schedule because it can accommodate that. Um, the ability to be flexible is the purported goal, but unfortunately what this legislation actually does is provide an increase in the number of days that employees can call out last minute from five to 15. As it's written, they could use their personal time, they could tell their employer they're using their personal time when it's practicable if for an unforeseeable reason without specifying what would qualify or requiring it to be an emergency. In summary, more is included in my written testimony, but we are in opposition to this legislation. You ready? Good afternoon, my name is Rob Bookman. I'm a partner in the law firm Bozetsky and Bookman. Uh, I've been testifying on behalf of small businesses before this council for 32 plus years now. Um, I am counsel to two trade to small business trade associations, the New York City Newsstand Operators Association, as well as the New York City Hospitality Alliance. Uh, Mr. Riggi is our executive director and we'll be testifying concerning them. Uh, I do have to say that I am uh, a bit offended that in this short notice hearing, uh, apparently such short notice that only you, Mr. Chairman, were able to devote three hours to what is supposedly such an important issue and that both the sponsor of this bill and all the other members of the committee didn't find it an important enough issue to actually stay and listen. I find it extraordinarily offensive. Um, I guess the question here is not whether paid, paid leave is a good thing for people to have. Of course it is. The question is who's going to be paying for it? Um, that's the issue. Um, Everybody has a New York City paid time off now. Uh, under the paid sick leave law, you get five days off. You could take it for any reason really whatsoever. So the question is, who's going to pay for this expansion from five to 15 days off? Historically, when we in this country have expanded the social safety net from whether you're talking about Social Security, Medicare, unemployment insurance, disability, uh, food assistance, housing assistance, every time we expand the social safety net, it's a shared expense between employees, employers, government. Uh, government sets up an insurance program, for example. Uh, there's a payroll tax that everybody pays into. This concept that you could just wave a magic wand and require a major new cost for small businesses in New York, um, with, and it just be borne by the small businesses is just not realistic and it's not honest. Uh, it's like Trump saying that the tariffs are being paid for by China. It's not being paid for by China. It's being paid for by all of us, by businesses and consumers. When you pass something like this, it has to be paid for. It's going to be paid for by your constituents with higher prices. It's going to be paid for by businesses with lower profits. It's going to be paid for by the employees who this is supposed to benefit by having fewer of them because the more you make it expensive to have an employee, the more people close their businesses, the more they automate, you mentioned that. Um, that's the reality. Uh, and so there is no free lunch, and the question is who's going to be paying for it? And I agree with uh, Councilman Ehrlich, if this is that significant, then the city needs to come up with a funding mechanism that's not just pretending that, that it's free. Um, I also do not trust rulemaking to fill out the law. The council's job is to fill out the law, and there are very troubling aspects of this bill that should be addressed in the bill and not in rulemaking. Uh, finally, I just want to note those employees who testified in the first panel who worked at these large employers at, at the airport, that, those are government contracts, and you have control over that. The government who, offers the, who gives those contracts should require that they be paid leave as part of that for, for companies. You don't need to pass a law to help the people who are here at the first panel. Thank you.
Good afternoon. My name is Andrew Ridgey. I am the executive director of the New York City Hospitality Alliance. We are a not-for-profit trade association that represents the restaurant and nightlife industry in the five boroughs. Um, I've submitted my testimony. Much has been said. Um, but I just need to state it again. We're at a time where you can walk through every single neighborhood around our city and there are vacant storefronts. Every time you hear a council member or someone else uh, talking about small businesses, they say we must preserve our small mom and pop shops, our local cafes, our favorite bar. Yet every single action that is taken is not to actually help support those businesses we're claiming to want to support. Every time we're in these chambers, as was mentioned before, it seems to be almost always another bill that makes it more expensive, more complicated to run a business. And as Mr. Bookman said, if this is a shared cause that our city believes that paid vacation should be a social safety net, then let's talk about everyone sharing in that pot. There are tons of ways that we can reduce costs, uh, but none of that is ever discussed in a significant way. Someone mentioned in an earlier panel the real estate or property taxes that are going up. Well, guess what? Those get passed through to the tenant, and they go up thousands and thousands of dollars. It's putting immense pressure on local businesses. The minimum wage has been increased six years in a row, I believe. The uh, tipped wage in the past three years has doubled. We've had paid sick leave, and I'm not sure exactly where that data came from earlier, but. I can walk into 50 or 84 or however many businesses was mentioned earlier, and they will tell you, not only is it expensive, um, but it's complicated to administer. And something specific to the hospitality, retail, restaurant, nightlife industry is that we're not just paying for that one person to be out for the day, where they come back the following day and their work is on their desk. No, we also have to pay the additional cost of replacing that employee, whether they're a line cook or a server or a bartender or a dish Washer. We cannot just go without them. So you have that cost. Also, look at the restaurant nightlife industry. What are the most popular times for people to go out? Nights, weekends, holidays, Mother's Day, New Year's Eve, all of the times when people are going out to eat and going out to spend time with certain family members or doing whatever, these are the times we need to be running uh, at full staff. And it's already challenging enough in our industry because there's a shortage of line cooks, there's a shortage of other positions to ensure that we can run with a full staff, that we can keep our doors open, and the city should be talking about ways to help support us. Restaurants have been wanted the opportunity to add a clearly disclosed administrative fee to menus. No. We've been looking for a further reduction in the commercial rent tax businesses pay. No. We've been looking for a reduction in fines. No. We've been looking for cure periods and warning for non-imminent hazards to the health. No. Everything that we talk about supporting small businesses, we give all of these proposals. No, 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 no. But then when it comes to something that makes it even more difficult for business owners to operate here in our city, New York, guess what? Oh, this is moving really, really fast. Get on the train. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Blair Papagni, and I think I'm the only person so far today who's spoken who is an actual business owner. Um, I own restaurants in North Brooklyn, one in Williamsburg and one in Greenpoint. Uh, I've been really, really lucky to be embraced by the community that I have businesses in. I opened my first restaurant in 2007, and I still have retained some of that same staff from 2007. I think a part of that is because I think I am a good business owner. I think that even before there was paid sick leave, um, I adopted some of my own policies. I believe that this additional paid leave that small business is being asked to absorb is just a cost that we can't afford. I feel like the city has for a long time seen small business as an ATM that they can just come to and continue to withdraw funds from. And I believe that you can be solidly pro-small business and pro-employee, that those are not two different things because one needs the other. And I think that it would be wonderful for everyone to have their 40 hours of paid sick time and their additional 80 hours. But unlike the government, small business doesn't have the luxury of running without making a profit. We have to make a profit to stay in business. And with the increase in labor, 
a lot of us have seen our profits shrink and shrink, and we're getting 10%, some of us less. So if you start to increase what we have to then put out, at a certain point, it doesn't become worth it. And I love having a business. I love having employees. My businesses also provide internships to at-risk teens in my community. So it's more than just about the jobs. Um, I think I have about a minute left, and I think everyone else has spoken about the numbers really, really well. So I just also wanted to mention one of the other big threats to our industry, because I know that you're on the immigration chair, is the no-match letters that are being sent out that no one is talking about. And the very employees that we are trying to protect need protection from those letters. If you have a phone in your hand and you have not heard of no match letters, I implore you to Google it because it's a really big threat to workers. SSA is asking us as employers to look at numbers that they're saying are not correct. Now, we all know what the end game is here and it's an attack on our immigrant population and on our workers. And I think New York City needs to lead the charge in protecting our immigrants against no match letters. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Matt Greller, and I'm an attorney and a lobbyist here on behalf of one of my clients, NATO uh, Theater Owners of New York State. This is not the NATO in Europe. This is the Movie Theater Trade Association here in New York City. Uh, they represent 37 movie theaters here in the city with over 1,500 employees. And despite the well-intentioned reasons behind this legislation, we oppose the bill because it provides yet another costly and unfunded mandate upon businesses. The movie theater business model is based on ensuring that employees are safe, healthy, and happy because that's good for business. Uh, they remain employees. They don't require additional training for new employees. If an employee is sick or fears for their safety, they call their manager and they stay home without fear of losing their job. They did that before the mandate of paid sick leave, and obviously they um, comply with paid sick leave. Theaters, our food service establishment, and other businesses, they all absorb that additional cost of providing the 40 hours of paid sick leave in 2014. Some chose to freeze hiring. Some, that led to adoption of further automation. Others chose to increase prices. Some chose to cut salaries or other benefits. They did that not because they disagreed with paid sick leave. They did that because they had to figure out how to absorb the, an additional cost. This is going to have an additional cost of an additional 80 hours on top of the 40 hours of paid sick leave. So to be clear, we're not opposed to the concept of this additional paid time off, but we're opposed to legislatively mandating that on businesses that already provide some level of paid time off. Why isn't there further emphasis, as others have said, about creating jobs or lessening administrative burdens on businesses? And why aren't there further exemptions in this bill? The original paid sick time bill had many exemptions. Other jurisdictions had many exemptions for seasonal workers, uh, students, tipped employees, temporary workers. This bill exempts businesses with five or fewer employees. That's a huge disincentive to hiring that sixth employee. I would think we would want to hire more people in the city. And also, if a business gives a standard two-week bucket policy, it has to be done in the same accrual and the same reasons and conditions. Um, what if they just have a two-week bucket policy for personal vacation or safe or sick time? If it's different, they still have to provide another five uh, paid off days or, you know, 120 hours. If the point is to provide paid vacation days to employees who don't have any, then there should not be interference with employers who provide paid time off, period. Uh, this situation is made worse because accrual starts on day one, unlike San Francisco where it starts on day 90. Uh, the original paid sick time uh, started that on 120. That would help exempt seasonal employees. The theaters have very busy employees starting in Memorial Day, ending in Labor Day. They have students returning from college who begin in early May and leave in early September. They would then be able to go to college and take vacation time that would be paid. To me, that's not good public policy. We're happy to work with the committee. We're happy to work with you, Mr. Chairman, on finding ways to make this better. But I don't know that taking this concept and applying it to paid sick leave in the existing law is the best approach. Thank you. Thank you all. And, and just note that um, all of your statements will be taken into consideration. That's why we're here at this hearing to hear from industry as well as hear from workers and, and to make sure that we can come to a medium that, that mitigates the impact 
on businesses at the same time provides a service and at, in, in, in a very responsible way. Having one who, who was responsible for managing small numbers and large numbers of, of workers, I know that these provisions can't, this policy can't happen without provisions that govern them, right? Otherwise, it's kind of chaos, right? You can't have, uh, as I said, 75 days if you are a, a, uh, a business of, of five and, and just give people the autonomy to use them anyway, anytime, and, and still run a business, right? And as, as with Family Medical Leave Act, um, that gives uh, business a lot of latitude um, to, to be able to address that. But we need to hear from everybody in order for us to make this successful. So just um, w when you're called upon, please be willing to come back. And, and be a part of this, so thank you. Um, before the next panel, I, I need two minute recess. Bathroom break.
Okay, we can resume now. And the next panel, uh, Vladimir. Yes. Vladimir. We're just gonna go with the first oh, okay. Juniana. 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 Montero. And Valletta Luis. And there's one more stuff there. Rosa Rivera. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Junior Montgomery. I'm appreciative to be able to speak with you this afternoon about a very important issue that affects the quality of life for all New Yorkers. Paid time off. For myself, having time off from work without worrying about losing income, which I need to protect me and my family, is a huge deal for working people like myself and other workers in New York City. I have worked at JFK Airport for the past two years as a wheelchair attendant. We do not get paid vacation. This year, I had the flu, which caused my absence from work for seven days. I had already exhausted my five paid sick days due to a different ailment. So, I had to take the financial burden of no paycheck for my family for two weeks. In my time here, I have yet to be able to disconnect from any rest, relaxation, or to meet and hold my new grandchildren in my home country of Jamaica. I ask you, city council members to vote yes and pass this legislation. Thank you for your time and for this hearing. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Councilman uh, Chair. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to have my testimony today. Uh, my name is Vladimir Clay June and I'm uh, Happy to be speaking to you today. I've uh, worked at JFK for the past 12 years as a passenger service representative. Today, I'm here on uh, behalf of the thousands of airport workers who don't have access to adequate time off. You know, uh, airport workers are the ambassadors to the world. Well, the first thing that people see when they uh, come to the airports. And uh, we, we don't have the opportunity to go out and see the rest of the world uh, Paid. Throughout the years, I've seen my fellow colleagues miss out on things such as weddings, forego family celebrations, or just not take the opportunity to take a week off because when you get back, you won't, there won't be a paycheck waiting for you. Um, millions of people travel through the terminals that we work in each year. Uh, I think it'd be nice to see my fellow colleagues to be able to be, a, my fellow colleagues to get the opportunity to be passengers in the, in the terminals they maintain. You know, uh, city council members, I'd like to present uh, the copies of a petition that, it, uh, these copies of the petition that's been circulated throughout JFK and LaGuardia Airport. We have over 2,000 airport workers uh, signed it. 
uh, this petition urging the city council to pass this paid time off legislation. You know, as we continue to gain more signatures, I ask you city council members to vote yes and give airport workers access to paid time off. Uh, thank you again for your time and this hearing. Mi nombre es Violeta Luis. Tengo 62 años. My Yo, name is Violeta and I am 62 years old. Y soy una trabajadora de la comida rápida. I am a fast food worker. Yo quiero agradecer, agradecer al alcalde y al defensor público. I would like to thank the mayor and the city council and the public advocate y a los concejales de la ciudad por haber pensado en nosotros. For thinking about us and writing a, a law such as this one. Para mí, como trabajadora, esta ley va a ayudar mucho, importante. For me, this law will benefit me for my family and myself. Porque voy a tener un tiempo para visitar a mis familiares en la República Dominicana. Because I will be able to visit my family members in the Dominican Republic. Y no voy a preocuparme en dinero ni en el tiempo que voy a estar allá porque sé que me van a pagar. Voy a tener tiempo para pagar mis biles. Because I will know that I will have a secure back when I come home and I will know that I will be able to pay my bills when I come back from spending time with my family after long um, days and months from working in this corporation. Para mí, ayudar a mi familia a... Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much for listening to me. Mi nombre es Rosa Rivera. Trabajo en, um, en comida rápida. My name is Rosa Rivera, and I also work in a fast food restaurant. Este, le doy gracias al alcalde, Rey Velacio, por haberlo este, oído y ayudado, eh, ayudarlos en lo que las dos semanas de vacaciones que los quiere dar. Y también por lo los concejales que los han ayudado muchísimo también por ellos. Si no hubieran sido por ellos, nosotros no, no estuviéramos aquí. I thank um, the council members and I'm thanking the mayor, Bill de Blasio, for thinking about us and trying to create this law and trying to pass it. Y así si tengo cinco años que no voy a mi país, Al Salvador. It's been five years since I haven't been to El Salvador to see my mom and my family relatives. Si, si, lo, si Dios los ayuda a dar los, las dos semanas de vacaciones, voy a visitar mi familia y no vengo a preocupación porque tengo como para pagar mis biles, porque eso es lo primero que uno tiene cuando uno llega que tiene que pagar sus biles en este país. In, in this city, you have to pay your bills on time and having to worry about that is a burden but allowing us to give us a two weeks paid vacation will be a relief from uh, stressing ourselves out, um, especially if we want to go see our relatives that we haven't seen in a long time. Y le doy gracias a, a ustedes y a todo el público que los ha ayudado este, a seguir a, a lo que estamos luchando y, y gracias por ustedes. Thank you much, thank you very much and I appreciate um, everyone else who has been advocating for this law to pass, and we appreciate your time. And, I, and thank you um, for your testimony. I do have one question um, for the airport workers. Um, actually, for each, um, do you know the percentage or the number of full-time workers and how much um, pay time folks are currently receiving, if any? Uh, the accrual time is, as stated, one hour for every 30 hours worked. However, uh, until you 
have worked two years, after two years, that's when you start getting one more week vacation. So within the first two weeks, the first two years that you work, you do not get anything but the five paid sick days. Sick days. Okay. Okay, thank you. And, and um, is, uh, in your company, uh, the, do you know the percentage of workers uh, full-time versus part-time? Uh, it, 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 pretty much everybody is supposedly full-time and there are probably about 500 employees. Um, but as the company acquire, the, the owners acquire other companies, they've been able to get probably about uh, 50 other part-time workers. Okay. And in, in the fast food, uh, uh, in the fast food industry that you're working in, specifically um, in the business that you're working with, are they part-time, full-time employees? Yes, la mayoría are part-time, que trabajan la mitad del tiempo, la mayoría son de full-time, completo, entero. Entero. It's mostly full-time. Okay, gracias. And five percent. Gracias. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Final panel, Paul Son, Rosa, Cote, Marianne, Giannis, Gino. Tatiana Bear. And I think there's one Jonas. more. Jonas Schnee. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tatiana Bejar. I am the New York organizer at Hand in Hand, the Domestic Employers Network. We are a national uh, nonprofit organization. And I'm here on behalf of uh, two of our members who are employers of nannies and house cleaners. So I will uh, proceed to uh, read one of their uh, testimonies. Good afternoon, my name is Rosa Esquila Cote, and I am currently a domestic employer and here to share my enthusiastic support for the paid personal time legislation being proposed. I especially want to share how important it is that domestic workers have extended this benefit. I have employed Luisa, a member of the worker owned and nanny B child care cooperative, to care for my twin babies since September 2018. Luisa provides calm to the chaos. As a working mother, this is un invaluable to me. I'm also a member of Hand in Hand, the Domestic Employers Network. Hand in Hand is a national network of employers of nannies, house cleaners, and home attendants, our families and allies as well. We believe that dignified and respectful working conditions benefit worker and employer alike. We envision a future where people live in caring communities that recognize all of our interdependence. Together, we support employers to improve their employment practices and to collaborate with workers to change cultural norms and public policies. My wife and I gave birth to our babies very close in time. We were very lucky to take six months of maternity leave between both of our jobs, but once we had to go back to work, we were faced with deciding what type of childcare will work best for our family. Uh, regular day care for two babies at the same time was simply unaffordable, and we found hiding a part-time nanny for 20 hours a week made much, made much more sense for our needs. Um, sorry. Um, Luisa ensures that our babies are cared for physically and emotionally. Her work entails feeding them, putting them down for naps, watching them, and interacting with them to promote their development. Luisa has been an excellent employee and has developed a very caring relationship with our children. As a mom, I don't understand why anyone will want to mistreat under pain or not extend benefits to someone caring for their children. In fact, nannies should be afforded a level of pay and benefits that ensure they can take care of themselves and their loved ones, which in turn means they are able to bring their best to caring for our children. When it came to uh, pay time off, Luis and our family agreed on a set of federal holidays, one week of vacation and dialogue as needed about negotiating time off between we, when our family is on vacation and when Luisa prefers her vacation. 
it feels powerful to me that we are able to have these conversations where the dynamic is more equalized. I don't feel I am coercing Luisa, and she's empowered to make decisions that work for her. I believe Luisa's membership in NIB and participation in domestic worker movement makes this possible. If paid time, if paid personal time were to become low, more domestic workers and employers who will come to these conversations grounded in a fair standard backed up by the city. Fairness and dignity means the conditions Thank you. Thank you. Is this Hello? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Miller. Uh, um, my name is Paul Son. I'm with the National Employment Law Project. We're a national research and advocacy organization headquartered in New York City that works with federal, state, and local policymakers on a variety of workforce issues. We've been pleased to work with the council on a number of important uh, pieces of legislation in recent years. We uh, applaud you, the public advocate, and the mayor, uh, and testify in support of, of Intro 800A. I've submitted detailed written testimony. I'll just hit a few of the top points during my three minutes. Um, uh, on, on the important, the need for this legislation, you know, U.S. workers are more productive than ever, but aren't seeing the benefits. Instead, they're working longer hours, and just too many can't afford to take time off for basic life and family needs. Uh, among comparable industrialized countries, the U.S. is basically alone in not providing a paid leave standard. This is disproportionately a problem for low-wage and part-time workers, but not exclusively. I don't, today's, uh, this morning's New York Times notes that Google's co uh, contracted temp and staffing employees that make up 40 percent of the workforce don't, pr don't receive paid vacation. So it's a problem among, you know, segments of full-time and, and even highly paid employees. Um, you know, the, uh, you, you heard this morning uh, from segments of the employer community arguing that it's just too much uh, to, to do this at this time. And, you know, and there's no question that, that small businesses and employers in New York, uh, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing. You know, the commercial rent squeeze is very significant for businesses. The online competition is significant for retail. Um, but the reality is that providing 10 paid days off a year is a very modest, reasonable standard. And the fact that businesses representing 80, employing 81% of full-time workers in the city find a way to do it, and even those representing one-third of part-time workers do it. If they can do it, it really, it's, it's evidence that it's, it's manageable across the board, and the, 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 the formula that's been used successfully by the council and the state uh, for other labor standards are phasing it in gradually, having uh, extensive employer education and outreach, and addressing the practical questions in the regulations process, for example, you know, uh, coordination to ensure that, that all the employees at a firm don't take vacation at once. There are a lot of practical nuts and bolts questions that can be addressed. In my testimony, I flag, um, you know, four uh, 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 issues in the bill that we would respectfully urge the council to address. I'm going to just go into more detail on one of them, which is the omission of a private right of action. The reason there isn't one is because there wasn't one in the paid sick law, and this builds off of that law. Um, but the problem with it is it means that, is that, that the only way to enforce it is through the, uh, the, the, uh, the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. And as capable and competent as they are, they simply don't have the bandwidth to police uh, labor standards across the city's whole workforce. That's why our labor standard system at the federal, state, and local levels has always depended on a private-public partnership. In fact, more enforcement is pursued by workers with private rights of action than by government enforcement agencies. So, and, and in fact, the omission of the private right of action really is, 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 un, is out of step with what most other cities do and what the council has done in other recent laws. And it's, it's really a vestige of a more conservative time in New York City politics. I don't know if you recall, you know, Mayor Bloomberg vetoed the paid sick days law and Speaker Quinn insisted on taking out the private right of action as a condition of passing it. I think if it were being considered again today by you all, I, I'm pretty confident it would include a private right of action. So now really is the time to, to fix that omission as part of this measure. Thank you very much, Chair, Chairman Miller. Good morning, or good afternoon, I should say. I am Mary Ann Giannone, and my husband, Paul, and I are owners of two restaurants in Greenpoint. We both grew up in Brooklyn and moved to New Jersey a number of years ago, but we decided to come back to the city to open our first place, Paulie G's. Last year, through much perseverance and determination, we were able to open Paulie G's Slice Shop. 
I'm here as a business and restaurant owner who is concerned about all the laws that are being passed which do nothing to help small business owners in this city. At this point, it is incredibly difficult to operate a small business due to skyrocketing rents, high labor costs, costly permit and licensing processes, et cetera, et cetera. Many businesses are still reeling from the high labor costs, and now we are expected to give two weeks paid leave without any type of notice from the employee. Do you have any idea what havoc this will wreck for, havoc will wreck for the restaurant industry? If one pizza maker calls out and we don't have a replacement on a Saturday night at the last minute, it is challenging at best to keep up with our orders. We do not operate in a typical nine to five environment. Schedules change weekly. It is hard enough to manage all the scheduling as it is currently done. This amendment is going to force us to raise prices in order for us to not sustain operating losses. So ultimately, it is the people that vote for you that will be paying for the price for this policy. No one opens a business to lose money. And business owners will have to take necessary steps to ensure that they don't. The only way to do that is to employ fewer people, thus eliminating jobs and putting more of the burden on the remaining employees. So both the people who will have to pay higher prices and the people who will be losing jobs will be considering your decision when they enter the voting booth. Every time we turn around, there is another costly law or regulation that we have to adhere to in order to operate. The problem is most small businesses are going to be leaving New York City. Ultimately, since we opened almost nine and a half years ago, we have seen so many traditional mom and pop businesses closing up. Growing up in this great city, that was always the backbone of who we were. The way things are going, only large corporate restaurants and chains are going to be able to operate. I'm going to assume that all of you that are going to vote on this proposal have never run a small business, let alone a food establishment. It is a daunting task. Just to remind you, we employ many employees, pay a lot in taxes, and support the tourism industry in this city, as most people who come into our place are from all over the world, thereby adding to the unique experience that is New York City. I would really hate to see more small businesses close, but if they keep getting hit so hard, it will in inevitably happen. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Jonas Scheinder. I'm the uh, chief economist at the Fiscal Policy Institute. Uh, that is a nonpartisan, nonprofit think tank that produces research on uh, New York economic, tax, budget, migration, and other policy uh, issues. The Fiscal Policy Institute views the Initiative 800A as a meaningful step in the direction of developing a comprehensive leave policy a framework for, um, for New York City workers. Now, I would, of course, uh, I would refer to my testimony, which I submitted for, uh, for details, uh, but just uh, to th think about um, how much it's going to cost uh, to provide the, uh, you know, the leave uh, to the workers. It is, well, a lot of people say it's going to cost a lot, and how can we afford this? The real question is, how can we afford not to? Anybody knows, anybody who works very hard, especially uh, the people who have less education, and the people who have uh, fewer opportunities, they work very hard and, uh, and they miss on a lot of uh, life events and they cannot uh, you know, really skip work because they fear uh, to lose their work. Now, that makes a very unproductive worker. And to boost worker productivity, workers need to be well rested, they need to be uh, engaged, they need to be enthusiastic, and that is very difficult to achieve when workers feel like they have to show up, otherwise they will be, uh, they will be uh, in trouble. Everybody is getting squeezed by rents, not only the businesses, but also the workers themselves. Can you imagine what it is like uh, to, uh, to know that one week that you miss is going to mean that you cannot make the rent, and rents are very high in the city. Businesses, usually, are very challenging to run. One of the challenges, and the main challenge of running a business, is adapting to change. 
I think it is uh, the function of this, of this body to make sure that the change that the businesses will have to uh, go through as they accommodate new labor standards that are uh, appropriate for the, uh, for the changing workplace of the 21st century, that that change is manageable. We've heard uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of negativity when the, uh, when the minimum wage uh, was being increased to the $15 an hour. Businesses would leave, they would shut down, and, and there would be uh, no jobs. It only uh, takes sticking your head out of the window to see that the city economy is prospering, there are more jobs, there's economic growth, and the opportunities are abound. This is a good move. Do it. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I'm, uh, once again, certainly, uh, Professor, we'll be calling on fiscal policy as we institute, as, as we have clearly done in the past uh, when, when creating and, and, and debating uh, policy, it's such important policy in the city of New York. Um, but to each and every one of you, certainly we are hearing, hearing the voices of small businesses. Important that you are here today to speak your truth and that we hear that and that we are able to kind of disseminate from those industries that, that really need and could use the support in those uh, industries that have taken advantage of, of, of workers and, and current laws or the lack thereof and not providing um, these benefits and even though they uh, employ hundreds of workers we, we've heard that testimony as well so um, we're going to take all of this into consideration and we are uh, right now kind of working on a small business round table and we'll ask that many of the folks that have come to testify today they come back to lend their voice certainly the voice of workers we want to appreciate you ladies staying to the end um, and uh, those of you who testified, and not just today, but the work that you've done on behalf of domestic workers and workers um, throughout the city and the country is greatly, greatly appreciated. Um, I certainly appreciate it. Uh, the quality of life that you've been able to create for the women in that, this industry um, in a very short period of time, even though it's, it, it appears that way, I know the struggle has, has been ongoing and, and continues to happen. Um, but you have changed lives, so continue to do what you do. And um, we will look forward to hearing from everyone and bringing folks back before anything else is, we move further with the legislation. I think the purpose here is to hear the voices of each and every one of you that are involved and make sure that your voice is being heard um, and so that we can move forward with this important legislation. So I wanna thank everyone for coming out. Uh, it's been a bit of a long day, and thank you so very much. As I, I again, I, I, I reiterate the great Dr. King, and that all labor that uplifts lifts humanity has dignity, and um, you've demonstrated that today. So uh, thank you all for coming out. This hearing is adjourned. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I, we, 